All right, guys. So I'm here with Ryan Christensen, uh, hypnosis, uh, hypnotherapist. Uh, he is part of the Red Pill community. He's kind of like my first celebrity guest because he's been on with Rich Cooper. He's been on with John MLD. He's been on with Sterling Cooper. He's been on uh, with a lot of the guys that I really look up to and respect and kind of follow, uh, follow. I pretty much watched all of his interviews. Um, I had a session with him. It was pretty fucking awesome. And uh, we're here to get his life story as usual. So uh, let's start off from the beginning, you know, like uh, sure. earliest memories. So I was born in Alabama. Um, my, my dad was a contractor down there. I don't really remember much of that. I mostly remember after we moved to Kansas when I was probably like two or three years old. Um, and even from like the earliest days, I always was kind of like a little bit different. Like I never really fit in. And that kind of followed me through my entire life, you know, all through school, all through high school, all through college, all through my adult life. That theme of like being different was with me the whole time, right? And like Kansas is not exactly what you would call, you know, a metropolitan area, right? I was from Wichita, you know, it's 330,000 people, biggest city in Kansas, but you're still surrounded by farmland. It's relatively small, right? Um, and I was just always kind of the odd kid out. You know, I remember growing up, you know, I grew up on a, on a, on a cul-de-sac, right? So a bunch of houses, uh, kind of like circle of the end street. So dead end street. Right. And we got into that development right when it's being built. So we kind of like had all the families moving around us and built a very strong community very quickly. But, you know, so all the kids from all the neighbors would all play together, would be adventuring off here and there and like fucking playing in construction sites and, you know, crawling through fucking drainage tunnels and stuff like that. <laughs> like boys doing boy shit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I but I always kind of felt like I was a kid tagging along, you know, um, went to Catholic school growing up, uh, never really fit in there at all. I was actually failing in fourth grade. Cause I just like, this shit's boring. I'm not doing this stuff anymore. So I stopped doing schoolwork. That, that was um, totally me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, parents got me tested and like got moved over to the public school system to the gifted program and stuff where they've got more advanced classes and things like that. So I was in the public school system from there on out. Um, and, you know, did okay through high school. Um, again, had that whole, like, this is fucking boring. So I'm just going to stop doing homework and, you know, almost failed out of my senior year of high school. Or my, I had one teacher who was going to fail me out of English class because I just refused to do the assignments as board. Uh, <laughs> I so, so identify with this, by the way. Like, <laughs> I, like, I'll tell you, once you finish with this question, I'll tell you a little yeah. bit about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I, I left with like a 3.14 GPA out of high school, but I got a, uh, a National Merit Finalist Scholarship because I scored really high on my SATs and, and stuff like that. So I got a full ride scholarship to college. So I got off to college my first year to study computer science. You know, my dad was a computer science guy. Um, you know, I've been around computers since like 1979. I had my first computer at like four years old, right? It's kind of the life that I had. And so I decided, oh, well, I'm going to be doing computer science. And I got in there, was just bored out of my fucking mind. So I started drinking and playing cards and everything like that. You know, so I'd be up drinking and playing cards until like 10 o'clock in the morning, which is not very good whenever your classes start at 8 a.m. Um, so yeah. managed to leave, you know, my first year of college with a sub 1.0 GPA, um, which is a, that takes work. Uh, so I, you know, I don't even know back. what the, I don't even know what those scores mean. Like I totally forgot. So, you know, basically, you know, C is a 2.0. C is like your, mm -hmm. your average, you know, lowest passing grade. D is a 1.0. F is a zero. Mm -hmm. So my, my grades on average were like D's and F's. So I was like fucking failing through everything because I just okay, never yeah. showed up for class, right? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so the college just said, you know, you should probably just not come back. So I lost a four-year scholarship, full-ride scholarship. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So I had to move back home. You know, that was a very unpleasant summer. Uh, my folks were definitely not happy with me because they had made some sacrifices to kind of help me along while I was in college. Um, you know, we were... You know, middle class in Kansas, you know, middle class Midwest, you know, white guy kind of family, you know, we never really lacked for anything, but we also were never, never particularly well off, mm -hmm. right? You know, a lot of the neighbors around us were more successful and richer. And like, I remember this one kid down the street who was uh, my brother's age, so probably four or five years younger than I, you know, their first car was like a fucking Mercedes. I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. You know, I got my mother's hand-me-down, you know, my, my grandmother's hand-me-down 1976 Buick was my first car. Mm -hmm. right? I don't know. I don't so know anything about cars. <laughs> it's a, well, it's a, it's a big ass fucking boat of a car, right? Like, okay. it was like I got it in the, the 90s. So the thing was like fucking four or five years older than I was. Mm -hmm. 
my grandmother's it was my grandmother's car they hand me down from her so much of it a little embarrassing i guess riding around in there yeah, compared compared to whatever what everybody else is rolling in around in yeah but it had, did have a big ass v8 engine in it so i could get make it get up and move which was good but um yeah so i had to move back home and did community college for a little while trying to figure things out and uh was kind of had a, had this on again off again relationship with a girl uh that i met in high school and just on again off again thing and after the last time we broke up i was sitting there looking around and realizing like if i stay in kansas this is gonna be my life right yeah mm-hmm. kind of getting by fucking on again mm-hmm. off in relationships just like this is just not for me so i said fuck it and i joined the ring corps mm-hmm. and uh you know i just picked my shit up i'm gone and they shipped me off to california for a year for school and then texas for another six months for school and then i served in hawaii for about another three and a half years Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did five years in the Marine Corps as a Russian linguist. Um, I married a young lady that I met in language school who's from the Air Force. Mm-hmm. Uh, she moved out with me to Hawaii. And yeah, my Marine Corps w- career was uh, not what you would call particularly spectacular. Well, let me ask you a question before we get sure. there. Like, you know, uh, do, you, do you have any siblings? I've got a younger brother. He's about three and a half years younger than I am. And, um mm-hmm. You and know, so, like, uh, you know, your relationship and, like, you know, uh, sure. kind of stories, like, of, of uh, growing up, what you guys do, like, how did you get along, fighting, you know, uh, uh, supportive, like, you know. Oh, no, no, it was much more, you know, your normal sibling shit. Um, he was mm-hmm. always a lot more charismatic and outgoing than I was, always fit in a lot better than I did. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's always a little bit of jealousy about how easy he was able to make friends and stuff like that. Ah, uh, wow. You sound Never so really... much like me and my brother's relationship yeah. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it was never really a spiteful thing or anything like that. There wasn't a whole mm-hmm. lot of anger. Yeah. Um, you know, we, the, because the neighborhood we grew up in, like pretty much all the kids would play together because we're all mm-hmm. relatively close in age. Yeah. You know, a couple of couple kids, a couple of years older than I am. Some kids a few years younger than I was. Right. And so going up, like up until about high school, like it's just a this big fucking mob of boys doing creative, you know, fucking destructive stuff mm-hmm. because you're in Kansas and there's not a whole lot to do. So you, you make what kind of, what kind of destructive stuff did you do? Cause I'll, I'll tell you like, you know, we oh, used to man. break into places like, you know, tunnels and you know, spray painting and, you know, just like, um, for us, it's more like finding construction sites and like fucking chucking dirt clods at each other and having wars mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, going a lot of different places we shouldn't. We never really broke in anywhere. Um, the, I went through a phase of, you know, building explosives using leftover fireworks and, um, yeah, making, you know, because we were fun, big into right? explosives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, finding, well, you find a drainage tunnel, right? So you, you got the, the blast shielding and everything else and you like the thing, throw it down there and boom, and of course that fucking thing echoes for like half a mile. Yeah. It's fun. Like what else are you going to do when you're in the middle of the goddamn nowhere, right? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I grew up in New York City when we were doing right. that. <laughs> exactly. Like, you, yeah. just, you just make shit to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was interesting because, like, after I decided to run away and join the Marine Corps, like, I told my folks that, that evening, which was a very uncomfortable dinner. My folks uh-huh. were not pleased with that decision. Yeah. And two weeks later, my little brother decides to join, too. Oh, wow. Right. And so my mother fucking lit into me like it was nobody's business. He was Are you serious so for joining nice. the Marine Corps she lit yeah. into you? Wow, man. Well, That's not just amazing. necessarily because I did. She was definitely upset about that. But then my little brother decided to go, too. And she's like, fuck you for making that happen. Well, it's so interesting that, like, you know, me, yeah. it was so interesting that, you know, they would even be upset about that, you know. Um, like, you know, I had, uh, uh, you know, uh, my best friend when I was growing mm-hmm. up, he joined the Marine Corps. And it was nothing but like, you know, accolades for him. And just like, wow, man, are you really fucking doing this? And then, like, yeah. you know, like, like, the, so this leads to the kind of question that, like, you know, the, the fact that your parents were uh, discouraging you from doing something that is relatively considered positive. Um, like, was that the kind of relationship you had with your parents where it was just kind of like discouragement? Not exactly. So in this particular case, it's much more the fact that just like completely fucking came out of left field. <laughs> Was like, uh, hey, by the way, I'm going down to Oklahoma City tomorrow to, you know, and listen to Marine Corps. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Came out of nowhere. But that's kind of that's kind of one of the things that uh, that happens with me is, you know, I'll get this feeling of like, okay, this is oh. this thing I need to do, right? Yeah. I'll make that decision, like, this is this thing I need to do. And then as soon as I'm decision made, like, that's fucking happening. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I am making that thing happening. I am not waiting around. Like none of that shit. So like it's it, it's just like inspiration and then like determination and action. Like just like fucking like one two three. Yeah, one, two, that's three, not just, how most happens. people operate. <laughs> no, and I wouldn't say that that's how most of my life goes. But there's yeah. you know, mm-hmm. certain things that you know moments of inspiration or like things that just like click for me. I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'll kind of get to a few of those, uh, a few more of those moments later on in more recent history, but this is definitely one of those moments of like, I need to get the fuck out of Kansas. This is how I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm out. It was your ticket right. out. And right. so what was the, your, uh, the relationship like with your parents? Um, that's a good question. So, My father was kind of distant. Mm-hmm. You know, he was traveling a lot for work and things like that. And he was never really just um, all that emotionally open and stuff like that. It was much more for, you know, after after talking with him in later years, you know, mm-hmm. he really didn't have any idea mm-hmm. how to be a dad the way yeah. he wanted to be, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so he was doing, you know, the kind of stuff that he he thought the dad should do. Like, you know, hey, you should be playing sports and so forth and so on. Get out of the house mm-hmm. and go run around, yada, yada, right? And so there was a lot of pressure um throughout my life to to be something that I wasn't you know I see okay okay you know, uh-huh. I talked about how kind of like I've always felt different and there's always this pressure of like well you should do the same thing that everybody else is doing yeah uh-huh. that's that's how you know you should be a boy and should be yada yada this is just like how things are supposed to be right? yeah it's very very like you know like uh like, like why aren't you like Johnny why aren't you like you know I I, I had yeah that, that kind of stuff thing, you know right? like yeah, it yeah. wasn't necessarily comparing me to other people but mm-hmm. very much the sense that he wanted me he wanted something different for me than than what i wanted for myself right uh-huh. you know, kind of like the things that my brother was really good at like sports and all that kind of stuff he got a lot of yeah. praise for and i didn't do that shit so mm-hmm. okay right, just didn't get it right uh-huh so it's very much always a sense that i should be different from how i am and it's kind of also living in your brother's shadow um, not exactly, but there was definitely life always seemed easier for him than it did for mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, my mother was, she's, she's a great woman. She's very caring, but she's also very emotionally volatile when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of times, you know, depending upon the day and kind of how long it had been since the last fucking big ass explosion of, uh, you know, fights and stuff like that, you know, you just be tiptoeing through light, through the minefield, right? Trying to trying to figure out what was going to set yeah. it off that day, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. So it, more, it, was, it was kind of that, yeah, kind mm-hmm. of that sort of... Unsteady. It's like walking on eggshells, like, you know... You're walking on eggshells, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting in a situation where I've got to fucking watch what everybody else is doing and try and figure out what's going on with them to try and, like, not piss her off today. And I have to mm-hmm. do it from how I am. Uh-huh. And everybody else's life is easier than mine because they're not like me, right? Wow. So there's a lot of shit, right? Yeah, yeah. And the funny thing was, you know, I was talking talking to some of the guys at Hot Dude Con last night, and some of those guys have been through some serious shit, you know, like physical mm-hmm. abuse, emotional abuse, you know, people chucking fucking PlayStations at their head and stuff like that. Oh, like, yeah. Like, you know, narcissists, right? Mm-hmm. That was yeah. not my life. You know, yeah, that yeah. was not my mm-hmm. life, right? Uh-huh. And so for a long time, I didn't realize kind of how damaging that stuff was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it wasn't as obvious and severe as some of the fucking stories I've heard. Right? Yeah, I, I went through, you know, forever just thinking like, oh, the past is the past. I, you know, like, we're yeah. here now, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> totally amb- uh, like, uh, uh, oblivious to uh, the, 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 all these current issues were rooted in, you know, uh, that past. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, you know, when I joined the Marine Corps, um, there was definitely that initial, like, what the fuck are you doing sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. They definitely came around relatively quickly after after mm-hmm. my brother and I had shipped out and started, you know, going through the Marine Corps, you know, going to boot camp and stuff like that. They were been incredibly proud of, of what we've done and where we've been and have mm-hmm. done that. Um, yeah. But that initial, it was definitely uncomfortable in the initial stages for sure. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, like... They've been we, supportive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. They've go been ahead. supportive of my choices like after the fact, but they've mm. it's never been a oh yeah, absolutely we're hundred percent behind you all the way. It's always a are you sure uh, about this? Is this really what you want? Yada yada yada, are you sure you don't want to do this other way? Uh, it's not until I've had and shown uh-huh. some like success with the thing before they're like, Oh wow, okay, cool. Like 
Oh, like, it, like you got to prove us wrong kind of thing. And it, it's also like kind of like, uh, you know, hoping that they can uh, hold you in the place that they want you to be. Uh, but well, then once you kind of go off and do it, it's like, oh, well, we don't have any other choice. Well, I don't think it's really that. It's much more you of a situation right. of like, they don't fucking get me. I, like, I am uh -huh. I am flat out different, right? So yeah. they're mm -hmm. coming from a certain perspective. They just can't understand me and my world and how I fucking navigate. Mm -hmm. So they're whenever I come up with these crazy ass ideas like running away and join the Marine Corps, they're like, they're yeah. like that is not the life path that we were taught, my friend. This is how things are supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. like, why are you just like taking a fucking left turn to Albuquerque, right? This is like, what the hell are you bringing this stuff from out, out of that field at? So they just mm -hmm. don't get it, right? They just yeah. don't. Once things start working for me and they kind of see like what that's mm -hmm. doing for me and how it's working, they're like, oh, okay, now I get it. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a them trying to keep me stuck or anything like that. It's much more of a lack of understanding and inability to conceive of things from, from yeah I'm like this because in the general you know kind of uh uh situations like that it's it usually like kind of like over protection like mm -hmm. you know oh don't want you to get hurt or like you know want uh, you want you to do what we like oh we want you yeah. to be a lawyer you know like uh, that kind right. of stuff but like uh it's i guess it's just like uh you're um kind of uh being an oddball uh kind of a uh, it was like, exactly. uh, like, you know, unpredictable, you know, and I guess that's kind of maybe uncomfortable for your mom because she was unpredictable, you know? Right. No, that's definitely could be part of it, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely, you know, they grew up in Kansas. They grew up in a small town in Kansas, right? They're from yeah. that world, right? You know, they, mm -hmm. they live the, the Midwest typical story in a lot of uh, ways, right? You know, family, yeah. kids, settle down, got the house, mm -hmm. you know, living in forever, same friends forever, that kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. That's just their world. That's their life. Yeah. And so it can be hard for them to see outside that and see other ways. And my brother is living the same life as they are. Mm -hmm. So I'm the fucking oddball, you know, very much am the, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm the yeah, black yeah. sheep of the family, not in a bad mm -hmm. way. It's just like one of these mm -hmm. things is not like the other, my friend. Yeah. 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 So I guess we'll, uh, we'll now uh, we'll go into, I guess, the, the, the Marine joining the Marine Corps. Sure. So again, like, you know, it was a relationship the, and you left. There. Yeah. Yeah. So joined the Marine Corps, you know, did basic, went to language school, was there for a little over a year. Um, and again, you know, I'm still not necessarily fitting in with the Marine Corps. You know, mm. the way, not, I was not, I was not a good Marine. I was good at what I did, right? Uh, but I wasn't a good Marine, right? And can you explain that? A different flavor. So being a good Marine says, you know, you're like incredibly physical fit and you got all this discipline and yada yada. There's like a certain yeah. ethos and a certain like mm -hmm. archetype of what you should be if you're going to be a good Marine. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I so, was not that guy, you know. Uh -huh. so, like, was that, that also day, in terms you know, of like, like uh, following orders? Um, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely had my own approach to problem solving. Um, but it wasn't a situation where like I was incapable of following words and stuff like that. There's, mm -hmm. there's always that, that time when you just need to shut the hell up and do what you're told to make stuff happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's what needs to be done in that moment to accomplish mm -hmm. X, Y, or Z, or to make sure that this other thing doesn't happen. Just like, okay, your job right now is to fucking do this thing. Cause I got other shit I need to worry about. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's part of being in the military is learning that necessity. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. just sometimes you just shut up and do because that's mm -hmm. what needs to be done mm -hmm. um but definitely i would i would tend to push back and question things a lot more than perhaps they were comfortable with for sure yeah uh, and i was like you know i was still always the oddball right you know i had a group mm -hmm. of like five or six guys uh five or six people that i'd be playing like dungeons and dragons with all, all weekend rather than being going out to bars and drinking and shit like that so oh wow even in the marine corps i was still a geek Right. Yeah. Even the geekiest people to the Marine Corps, I was still a geek among geeks, you know. So I was like, I was definitely mm -hmm. out on the edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I like to talk about Marine Corps in terms of like there were so many things that it took from that that helped me later in life, and there's so many things that helped me change and make myself better. Mm -hmm. But that was not the path for me. That's not where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But I met my first wife in in language school. Um, and that was, that was an interesting relationship. She had been through a lot growing up mm -hmm. and uh, 
on the outside she she seemed like she had dealt with it all and was strong and so forth and so on i was really kind of impressed by that you know having yeah, so yeah. get through all this kind of crap mm-hmm. and you know so we started dating we decided to get married and in the, in the military if you're both in the military you're not guaranteed to be put in the same place mm-hmm. right oh that's so, right uh-huh. Right. So to make sure that we could actually get stationed next to each other, we oh, got married. Oh, married. So that our odds, our odds yeah. of actually being in the same fucking part of the country were much higher, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not guaranteed, you know, yeah, yeah. but much higher, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and she had gotten injured. She had messed up her knee um, in basic when she was going through Air Force Basic. And, you know, they were telling her that she was going to be going to Texas while I was going to Hawaii. So she decided to get out on a medical discharge. Mm -hmm. Um, so she moved out to Hawaii and we started trying to build our life together and you know things things weren't necessarily easy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trying to live with some isn't necessarily easy no of course Uh, not and she got pregnant pretty quick after she moved out to Hawaii with me Uh, and after our first son was born she she had a breakdown Mm -hmm. Um, which is very common with people with survivors of a lot of trauma you know women who have been through a lot of trauma whenever they have the first child like all Mm -hmm. that shit comes back and hits them like a ton of bricks if they haven't resolved it Mm -hmm. so she was she was in she was in pretty bad shape for a couple of months um and so like she didn't leave the house for a while she was on antidepressants to see it and the doctor and stuff like that so here i am you know i'm what 24 25 years old at this point mm-hmm. uh, i gotta take care of my wife I gotta yeah take care of my kid i have another kid uh-huh. um the the on again off again girl that i broke up with to you know that that I left. Yeah, I found out okay. right before I left for the Marine Corps that I've got a that she's pregnant, and it might be. Oh, my, oh not even that it was. It might be right because okay, I was not the only guy she was seeing at that time. Uh, my parents again were very not fucking happy about. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't like her at all, right? So yeah, yeah. You know, I'm trying to fucking juggle all this stuff and be a Marine and be the sole breadwinner in Hawaii, uh, where the cost of living is like massively high. Right? We're making like fourteen hundred bucks a month in Hawaii. Get, uh, uh, Milk was five and six dollars a gallon back then. You know, baby formula is insane. Diapers, yada yada yada. So we mm-hmm. were actually on food stamps for a while. Okay, we were actually mm-hmm. getting like government assistance uh, while I was fully employed in a re- yeah. work with free housing. Right, it's just, just that's just the fucking situation. Yeah, yeah. And so incredibly stressful time. Um, you know, nine eleven happens. I don't actually end up deploying or doing anything for that. Um, mm-hmm. I was kind of on deck for that, and then it's like, okay, well, if I'm be leaving, I want to get her. And my kid home so they mm-hmm. got support because she's actually pregnant for their second kid at that point in time mm-hmm. it's like she's not gonna be able to handle the shit on her own with me fucking gone doing yeah. more shit I, mm-hmm. that's not gonna happen mm-hmm. so it's like all right we need to pack her up and send her back to her folks so she's got support i'm like all right well if, if she's in that bad way then we're just not gonna, we're not gonna hold you we're not gonna send you out and i was only about six months out from from my end date anyway mm-hmm. so in a processing out of the marine corps uh in june of 2002 uh, moving back to Kansas, um, we actually stayed with my folks for for a while. Uh, and my plan was I'm going to join the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And we're going to station, you know, do that thing instead. And because mm-hmm. they still needed Russian Russian linguist, the Marine Corps didn't need any at that time. And like I said, you know, had a few marks on record because you know not physically fit and so forth and so on. Right, mm-hmm. stuff that didn't matter to the Air Force, but mattered the Marines. Um, but that just took that process took for freaking ever, and money was running out and everything else. I started bartending and going back to college and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, just to try and make ends meet and hear me and my wife and our, you know, me and my pregnant wife and our kid are living in my parents' basement. I'm definitely not a fun situation. Yeah. Start fighting and start fighting. And uh, one day, you know, we're fighting and, you know, I was talking about, you know, I don't know how it came up, but I, you know, started talking about how, you know, wanted to wait to start a family until we were solid and so forth and so on. We have been joking for a couple of years about how birth control is like 98% effective, right? Mm-hmm. Which means it's 2% bloody ineffective. Right, I, I thought it was ninety nine. Right, yeah, ninety nine right. no. right. yeah, to one. Right, a little matter. worse. <laughs> right, so maybe so. You know, we had joked for years about how, mm-hmm. like, you know, she had been on birth control and got pregnant anyway, and I just have super sperm and blah blah blah. And it was a joke for years, and then she tells me she hadn't been on birth control. <gasps> okay, that's common. Yeah, <laughs> we hear about about those stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow, you got this you was why we were yeah while we were married. She had lied to me about that. Wow, and that. That was definitely, that was a kick in the teeth. That was that, a kick in the teeth. That's a, I mean, deception, like, on a huge level. Oh, 100%. 100%. If, if a person could deceive realize, somebody yeah. on that, what else are they deceiving, you know? It's Especially like, wow. since we had been joking with all of our friends for years. About Ooh, that, right? That's part of the play. Two, yeah, two, two and a half years, right? 
And so, like, obviously things got heated. She decided to leave, you know? Yeah. And uh, she moved back. To, she took the kids and moved back with her parents in Tennessee. And uh -huh. like, we were trying to work things out. Like, okay, I'll go to counseling. You go to counseling. We'll see if we can get this done. And so I did. Went saw a therapist and started to, started counseling, started working through my shit. And a couple months later, I'm talking to her on the phone. I'm like, you know, hey, how's your counseling going? She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, we agreed that we're going to go see people and try and work oh, this shit out. It's like, are you, have you done that? She's like, no. I says, are you going to? She's like, no. I'm like, all right, well, if you don't want to follow through with that, then, then we're done. Mm. I want a divorce. And she's like, yeah. I swear to God, I will never forget this till the day I die. She's like, okay, I'll get a lawyer then. You want to talk to the kids? Oh. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> weaponizing children. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't even weaponizing children. It was just like she she had already checked out and wasn't going to fucking do anything. Uh-huh. Right? She wasn't going to do anything to try and fix stuff. Like, it was all on me to fix if I chose to. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, what, what, by what you said, like, that meant, like, you know, withholding uh like you know visitation rights like she was gonna fight oh, yeah. for like custody and all this kind of stuff well she got all that stuff by default because she's in tennessee and i'm in kansas so she's half the country away and there's uh, no way the state of tennessee uh, is going to take the kids away from her and give them to me wow there's no way that state of tennessee is going to let the divorce happen in kansas because the kids are in tennessee and the state what has to look out in situation oh yeah oh yeah so i got I got fucked kind of hard on that one in terms of custody mm -hmm. and, and child support and all that other stuff, right? And ever since then, you know, she was completely paying the ass with visitation and staying in contact with the kids. And eventually, you know, kind of fast forwarding a bit in 2012, like I was, you know, I lost my job for a month or two. Mm -hmm. And after that, she just stopped responding to any of my phone calls, any of my emails, any of that shit. So I haven't wow. talked to my two youngest kids since 2012. Oh, to this day. To this day, I haven't heard it from. Yeah. Oh wow! God damn, yeah. that yeah. that's really fucked. I mean, that that must really be hard. Uh, like you know, it's, it's uh, how how yeah. have you dealt with that? Um, like I made the decision after trying for a while to try and mm -hmm. make things happen and try and stay in touch and try and you know banging my head against that wall. It's like okay, if I keep banging my head against this wall, I'm gonna go nuts. You know, yeah, no, yeah. No, no power here. So it's like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. Just for my own fucking sanity, I have to, I have to let it go. Like, I'm yeah, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to save myself. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a horrible decision you have to make. And there's, you know, part of me that still regrets it. And part of me knows that with my life at the time and the work I was doing at the time, there's no way I was going to be able to be a full time dad for those kids. Mm -hmm. That my odds of even having the same custody as I did. And being able to enforce that were close to zero, right? Mm -hmm. The odds of trying to get the kids in, away from her because that was close to zero. Mm -hmm. Like my my power and legal system in the U.S. and that sort of stuff, pretty minimal because I didn't have any indications that she was doing anything bad to them, right? Mm -hmm. No evidence. The state of Tennessee. Yeah, there's no evidence, and 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 not even the best of my knowledge. Like you, you were so removed from the situation. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah and. I never had any indication that she treated the kids poorly. You know, as mm -hmm. far as I'm aware, she's a good mother for them, you know, yeah. in mm -hmm. capacity, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no reason for the state to take them away from her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no reason yeah. for them to do that. So my odds of success were like fucking pretty close to zero, you know? Did you end up also like having to pay alimony, child support, and all this? Oh, yeah. And so paid all child support up until last year, yeah. Wow, so paying child support without even having a phone call. Oh, yeah. I mean, what? I mean, that'd be devastating for, I mean, I'm sure it was, but okay. like, you know, uh, you know, like one of my favorite books is like Letting Go by David Hawkins. I don't know if you've heard of it, but like, it's uh, just like, you know, I've, I've really had to learn the process of letting go uh, to just, you know, get past a lot of things. It's just like, sometimes we're just like, like, there's nothing you can do. It's like, so just let it go. Yeah. You know? And it's just, uh, but, but that is such a situation of, uh, it's, it's, it's immense gravity. It's, it's like, you know, yeah. it's, it's just, I mean, I, I'm not trying to bring up like, you know, these emotions, no, no, no. but like, you know, perfectly just, fine, uh, perfectly fine. And honestly, like I hadn't really processed and dealt with that until mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of work on myself over the summer and this fall going to a mm -hmm. lot of retreats and doing a lot, trying to do some deep work on myself just to, mm -hmm. you know, figure shit out and unfuck it. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until like October that I, that I really like kind of like 
dealt with and confronted and processed the fact of how much that had been affecting me for so long. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, right now I'm kind of trying to weigh out options and figure out like how to get in touch with them because they're now 19 and 21 years old. Okay. You know, uh-huh. yeah. So they're, they're adults now, you know, but I've got, last I heard they were in Florida, but like that was years ago. I mean, so have I you, have you looked them up on Facebook or anything like that? No. Well, I have, but they're, I, they've obviously blocked me a long ass fucking time ago. Oh, because, she, oh man, because she probably painted a fucking negative picture of you. Oh, oh most likely. Yeah. Wow. That's so, brutal. Uh, yeah, so like, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to have to be a process of finding them and trying to find a way yeah. to contact and at least to extend that olive, olive branch of like, Hey, I'm here. If you want to, if you want to find an address right? or got, something I got or, no even, idea. Right. or even clip something out of this video and send it to them. I mean, what? Wow. Yeah. That's just, it's just like, cause it's just like, it's so unjust and it's like, you know, it's so hard when, you know, when you uh, have, have had a, uh, a conflict with somebody and then they mm-hmm. like shut the door and you don't even get to explain your side, like, you know, and it's like, and then, you know, somebody has this like picture in their head of you that is totally distorted and fucked up. Sure. And it's just like, that's not me. Like, just let, give right. me a chance to explain, you know. Like, and the yeah. other piece of it, though, is that like, it kind of has to be their choice too, right? Like, I can't force them to do that. You know, it doesn't matter that, mm-hmm. fundamentally, it doesn't matter that their mother said X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter that I don't get my day in court, so to speak with them, right? Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. The grown ass men, they get to make the decision of what kind of relationship they want. If they want that, have mm-hmm. to have that conversation. If they don't want anything to do with me, that has to be their choice. And I have to be willing to accept that, you know? Yeah. And it's also like, you know, if you, if you consider like, you know, uh, time as a factor, as well yeah. as like all the information that's out there, you know, like the red, the red pill is blowing up like crazy. I mean, I know like it always says like, oh, it would need to, you know, be like underground, but it seems like it's unstoppable. And like so many males are, you know, like coming across this out of nowhere. Eventually, mm-hmm. I imagine they're going to come across some video where they're going to see these kind of like uh, play by plays happening in other people's lives and relationships and reading about in books. And then, and then they might be like, hey, you know what? maybe there's another side to this, but you know, when you're youthful and all that kind of stuff, you know, like the uh, dopamine centers of the brain, like over, like the, what is it? The action part of the brain, like uh, overrides the, uh, the rational uh, side of the brain. That's why they like young people in war and all these kind of things. So it's like more like, you know, uh, kind of emotion driven than, uh, than logical thinking, but it, like, yeah. And think about it this way. Even if you are logically think logically driven, mm. the worldview that you're operating in is the one with the parent who's saying, you know, it's like yeah. you've got the authority figure in your life saying, this is what happened. Yeah. yeah. Which you doubt. Yeah. So it, if you're looking it, at things from a logical perspective, the information that's coming into your system and your brain to fucking make these decisions is still skewed. Yeah. Yeah. But kind of getting back to it, like, I still need to figure out like there's a lot of things that have changed for me in the past six months to a year. And so my life is Mm -hmm. is very much up in the air in a lot of ways right now. So I need to kind of like let things land for me and then I can Mm -hmm. make some decisions about how to reach out or find them or give them that option. Mm -hmm. And so, and then based on what happens with that, then I can actually make some decisions about moving forward. So there's, I'm nowhere near making a call on how to handle that, you know, my relationship, you know, I, I think I would like that. I think mm-hmm. I'd like to be able to at least, you know, make contact and mm-hmm. make amends in a lot of ways for not being there, not being able to be there, right? Well, that mean, shit it, has an impact on them too. It's not about, but, it's not all about the impact on me too, right? You know? Well, this is the question I want to have though. I mean, like making an amends would mean that you did something wrong, but you didn't. Sure. So it's more like so, an explanation because it's like, well, no, because here's the thing, like, even though I made the right decision for me, it's not like that didn't have costs. No, I'm saying like the right? decision was like, I mean, like, well, this is just a question I have, like, what choice did you have in the matter? What road could you have taken? Like, if you would have stayed married, that's the only choice you had, right? No. I mean, there were still other things that I probably could have done legally. And, mm. you know, there's still probably things. Oh, that, you know, 
Okay, you know, I see what you're saying. Probably could have done right to mm. try and make try and force that issue, but yeah, it was a point where I didn't have the the mental and emotional capacity to make that happen. Yeah, and, and it was also, also being overwhelmed with like you know so oh, yeah. many things in life. I mean, it, 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 you did not have an easy life. It, it's like no, you no. know struggling financially, like you know, and and all this kind of stuff. It's just like. Wow, I mean, it, it, like if you have to make amends, it's a small amends, like it, it, with well, a big explanation, I would imagine. For me, making amends isn't I did something wrong. Making okay. amends is I know that I hurt you. I know that I didn't give you the things that I that that you needed from me. Uh -huh. and I'm sorry for that, right? I my actions had consequences for you mm. that I didn't want to have happen. Perhaps and, uh, I don't know why I made that choice, but yeah. like I am sorry for the fact that they suffered because I had to fucking save myself. Yeah, like, yeah. If yeah. you're if if you and your kids are drowning and you choose to fucking save yourself, like they still hurt, even if it's the right decision for you. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it sounds like it amends with acknowledgement. You know? Yeah, yeah. More on the acknowledgement like, side, but yeah, yeah. Wow. I don't. Or, maybe not. About, maybe not. I don't give a fuck about the guilt and blame of it. Like that's that's not yeah. even a mm. thing for me. But like, yeah, yeah, it's just like cleaning suffered. up your side of the street. Like yeah. you know, I, I exactly. do that all the time as well. It's just like even for minor things or this or that. Like you know, I go to the person and just like say, hey, I did that, this and that, and and it has nothing to do with like you know, it has less to do with their you know uh, feelings on the whole thing. It's just like I need to feel that like you know, that I uh, uh, took um, charge of, you know, what I need to do and uh, cleaned took up. Ownership, took ownership, ownership of the consequences of your actions, right? Mm -hmm. It's ownership of the consequences of your actions, acknowledging mm -hmm. the the consequences and the choices you make, mm -hmm. the things you've done, the things you haven't done, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, that's kind of, you know, I consider, I look at it as making amends. You know? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, how I do things. Yeah, yeah. I don't want like, you know, I don't mean to get into semantics. I'm just no, like, no, no, it's all good. like no, I'm I'm like such a uh, like a, a, a vocabulary like junkie in a sense. Like you know, like, I get yeah. so focused on like uh, semantics sometimes that it's just like <laughs> can like divert a whole fucking conversation. Right, and, and actually, these are good <laughs> conversations to have because there's nuance there, right? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. there's nuance in that in that conversation of is it this, is it that? What exactly are you doing? What do you mean by that? Right? Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Because I don't take responsibility for the situation. I don't take responsibility for getting into that situation and, and mm -hmm. hurt part of it, right? I've not, I acknowledge that I fucking chose myself over that. Mm -hmm. right? I made that fucking choice, right? I yeah. own that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not saying I'm blameless. I'm not saying I'm guiltless. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's all my fault. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is the fucking situation and I know it hurts you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. and in, those situ in those situations, there's probably no good choice. Mm -hmm. You know, there really isn't good no, choice. No, no, it, 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 it's, it's, all it's an almost an impossible choice. It's like, it's almost like yeah. a false dichotomy. It's like, you think yeah. you have a choice, but you really don't. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that was that was my first marriage and, and you know, going through that whole divorce process. And in 2004, I moved from kansas to northern virginia um i had joined the air national guard which is kind of like the reserves for uh, the mm -hmm. air force um just kind of keep my toe in the in the military life because i was missing that kind of structure mm -hmm. and people were performing at a higher level and stuff like that and missing that camaraderie and kind of missing some of the uh the access and the insight that i had while i was in the military um i was working intel for the air national guard i worked intel for the for the marine mm -hmm. corps and stuff like that so being on the inside you know and and having access to information in, in a different view of the world that you can get from the outside, you're mm -hmm. gonna miss that, right? Now, are you, are you allowed to talk about uh, your intelligence uh, work or is that like classified stuff? It's, it's all classified stuff. Right? Okay. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I was in the Marine Corps, my job was Russian linguist, right? So I was there to translate Russian. When I was in the Air Force, I worked in mm -hmm. Intel for like F-16s and F-22s and Predators and U-2s and stuff like that. So it's all mm -hmm. about like, you know, planning out missions and shit like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I moved to DC, I became a contractor for the federal government, uh, worked stuff there. I worked counterterrorism for like seven years or so, seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. I worked counter proliferation and going after weapons of mass destruction for probably about seven mm -hmm. years as well. Some project mm -hmm. management stuff and things like that in there too. Um, so my world since, you know, my early twenties was all service to the country. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all like 
making you know trying to stop bad shit from happening to the people that yeah. don't deserve it. You know, uh, and definitely working in working in the you know out of the public eye. You know, doing mm. shit that nobody's if 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 I if I did my work right, you know, never ever ever gonna fucking hear about it. Nobody's ever gonna yeah yeah mm. right. It's it's like a thankless job in a sense. Yeah, yeah, mm. and you know, it was it was incredibly satisfying for a very long time, mm-hmm. right? But we were kind of talking before uh, before the we started this interview about yeah. you know, kind of the idea of service to others and service to the greater good. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked a little bit in the beginning about, you know, how I always felt different and so forth and so on. There's always this pressure to be different and so forth. And in a lot of ways, I'd given up on life at a very young age. Like there's just nothing in life for me mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I'm too different, you know? And yeah. so the way I kept going was this idea mm-hmm. of service to others, right? Yeah. If yeah. I'm sacrificing, if I'm sacrificing myself for the greater good, mm-hmm. then my life has meaning and value, even though, yeah, I don't get to enjoy it, right? Yeah, there's still and meaning, it, there's still value to it. There's still purpose to it, right? Yeah, and it's interesting because so I'll go over some of the things we were talking about because, like, you know, like I myself like grew up in like the cult of twelve step programs. You know, my mom got into it very young uh, when you know when I was like you know six or seven, eight or whatever. And like, you know, uh, then by proxy, because, you know, I had like addiction issues, like, you know, I ended up in it myself. And like, that's the, the, like the, one of the three like, uh, pillars, uh, of, of what you know, is service. You know, if you're having a problem, pick up the phone, give somebody else a call, uh, which, you know, some of these things I still kind of do today, but it, it's like, you know, when that becomes your, like, uh, kind of like modality, your, 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 your way of life of just like living for other people. And just like, you know, I don't know, for like, at least on my end, it was like always trying to fix people's problems and like, right. you know, like being an expert in knowing what to do, but like not mm-hmm. being able to do it for myself. Right. Well, cause in that sort of situation, like you don't matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're yeah, fucking yeah. relevant. You as a person, your life is irrelevant. You're not going to get anything good, of course, cause you don't matter. You don't deserve it, right? Right. Yeah. I'm too different. I'm never going to get what I want to need, right? So, mm-hmm. if I'm not going to get what I want to need, the best I can do is to make sure that other people have what they need. Well, so so one right? thing so, that's interesting, you know, uh, about us and uh, where we kind of, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a, a mm-hmm. little bit different because, like, you know, I was uh, always very different, and like, uh, and I still am, um, mm-hmm. but I've always embraced it, and I've always been like, you know, like proud of it. And uh, almost to a arrogant, like, uh, extent. But, like, you know, I was kind of, like, more, like, the leader of, like, the pack. But, like, still, like, didn't fit in with the popular kids and all that kind of stuff. So, it's just, like, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's just interesting, like, how, you know, people can uh, get to that place of, like... Uh, so, uh, of, of, like, kind of doing yeah. everything for everyone else because there's nothing there for you, right? Having given up and basically said... Oh, yeah, so, so, so that's yeah. the thing, like, like, like where, where we both have, like, such different kind of, like, uh, personalities, or at least, you know, back then, of, mm-hmm. uh, of, like, you know, being oddballs, but, like, you know, one taking a back seat and one, like, taking a forward seat, but mm-hmm. still, like, living for other people. Yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, it, it's kind of like, okay, I'm different, so there's something wrong with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. And if there's something wrong with me, then, you know, how much do I really deserve? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, like it's like, if I don't feel I can succeed, well, at least I can help. It's like living by uh, living uh, by proxy. No, what is that? Vicariously. Is it word? Vicariously through somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Kind of, kind of. Um, I never really got the... You know, it, it wasn't living vicariously for me. It uh-huh. wasn't like I'm gonna be happy because they're happy. It's more that was irrelevant. You really, know, I didn't necessarily take joy and satisfaction in the fact that somebody else is doing good because I helped them. Right? Oh wow! I took pride okay. in my work, you know, and yeah. I and I, mm-hmm. and I knew that the things that I did kind of had an impact on on the global stage and so forth and so yeah. on, changed mm-hmm. the course of history and yada yada yada. Right? Like, yeah there's definitely shit that I've done that have nudged the needle here and there. Right. But mm-hmm. at the same time, you know, when it kind of came down to the past few years, you know, especially like there was definitely that feeling like I keep on throwing myself under the bus and sacrificing myself and mm-hmm. create personal, like 
psychological, emotional cost to all this stuff, right? You're not mm-hmm. dealing with the good parts of humanity when you're playing in that world. Like, you're yeah, yeah. hating all kinds of heinous shit, you know? It's like being mm-hmm. a cop, right? Mm-hmm. They don't get to deal with the fucking, you know, puppies and fuzzy and happiness. Like, that's not the mm-hmm. fucking world that they're dealing yeah. with, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of baggage that you take on as part of that, right? Mm-hmm. And very much feeling like, you know, I'm there sacrificing for my, sacrificing of myself to try and buy time and create space for people to make the world better. Mm-hmm. And nobody's actually fucking doing it, right? Mm-hmm. So that all that, all that effort's wasted, all that sacrifice is irrelevant because nobody's yeah. taking, taking, taking advantage of the space that I'm creating to make the world better, right? Yeah, so it, it's interesting because you kind of looked at it on a world scale. And I think for me, it was more of like, you know, first off, it was kind of like playing a video game, like, sure. you know, like uh, that person wins. It's like I scored, but like at least I'm behind the screen and I'm not taking any right. real risk, you know. So for me, it was unwritten contract, expectations. Uh, covert contract. Covert yeah, contracts. yeah, covert yeah. contract. Yeah. So it was like expectations like, OK, well, I did all this stuff for you. Well, now when I'm in trouble, you're going to save me. And what I found is people tend to forget very quickly about what you did and, and as well as the level of how much you did for them. And then like, you know, and, and then take also credit for the, your things that you did and for like, as if they did it themselves and just like, you know, like leave you aside. Like Ryan yeah. Stone said something very interesting in this last the rule zero, like this thing about like no good deed goes unpunished. And I never really understood that so well until I heard Ryan Stone speak about it. Yeah, yeah, and and then take that dynamic and then mm-hmm. add these other elements to it. You know, from from my perspective, like okay, nobody even fucking knows you did anything for them in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because I like, know that the, what what you're saying there because my brother, you know, like like you were the younger brother, my brother was younger, and he was kind of like in the background. Brother, yeah. So he like like he uh was overshadowed by me you know i was like a crazy troublemaker and all these kind of things and so like he was always in the background and it seems like because you were kind of uh like the you know the the background child that you went into like covert ways of like making the world a better place which was certainly a more honorable way of uh dealing with the issue than i did but like uh it, it still like uh hiding in a sense you yeah know? definitely i've always been you know, kind of power behind the throne guy working in the shadows, like never taking center stage. Like that's always been my, my way of being. Well, it's mm-hmm. like, if I don't, if I don't belong, I'm yeah. sure as fuck not going to step out on stage where everybody can see me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See that I don't fucking belong. It's like, no, 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 no. I'll play, I'll play in the background. That's fine. Somebody else can be up front. You know, so let me ask you something like, uh, have you like, a uh, um, were you afraid of like public speaking and things like that? I don't know if like you ever had like if that was ever a part of your life or opportunity. Not exactly. Or... Like mm-hmm. whenever I was in a public speaking role, it was always to like present information that I had that people needed, so decision makers can make decisions and stuff like that. So I'm mm-hmm. just like walking out and making just telling people what they need to hear, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. But I'm not like standing out on stage in front of like like this, like YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that was not what I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was always it was always much more. Um, much smaller audiences. Um, but, you know, I briefed, you know, fairly senior people about stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we need you to do. This is the decisions I need you to make. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And I had absolutely no problem doing that because I was just, at that point, I was supporting their process. It wasn't about me. Yeah. So I'm uh-huh. making sure that they could do what they needed to do. And if that meant I had to sit there and tell them, a, B, and C, and convey okay. all that shit. That's what needs to happen, right? Kind of goes uh, back to that uh, that following orders duty thing of like, this is what needs to happen. Yeah, so yeah. I'll make that happen. Mm-hmm. What I feel about it personally doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, mm-hmm. this needs to be done. So it gets. Wow, done. I right. would have done terrible in the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not for everybody. Let me tell you that. <laughs> Um, but for a lot of people going through the military, whether it's Marine Corps or another service, mm-hmm. um, it does help you see the world in a different way and gain some skills and gain a way to navigate. That is definitely helpful in a lot of ways going down the road. No, I imagine so, because like, you know, as I mentioned to you, like my friend, uh, Bill, who, uh, you know, he, like, he, it just like, it came out of nowhere as well. Like, you know, at least for us, like, you know, it was like, I'm joining the Marine Corps and it's like, what? 
Like, you know, like, like, are you serious? Like you were like, you were one of us, like, you know, we were, like we had our whole thing and everything. And then, then he goes and joins and it, and it's just like fucking mind blowing, you know, just like yeah. a, a, such a shift. Yeah. Well, it, it was definitely, you know, for me, you know, to kind of go back to that, it was definitely a means to an end. It's like, I need to mm-hmm. get the fuck out. Like if I'm going to do thing, if I'm going to join the military, then fuck it. I might as well just go hard. Right. If yeah. I'm, like, I'm going to go at it. I'm going to fight. I might as well really do it. Right. I'm not going to mess around and just go to the air force. Cause it's easy. It's like, if I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, to kind of get back to, to the chronology. Right. So I moved to DC and I started doing the contracting work. Um, and about that same time I got in the whole BDSM and kink. Um, scene yeah. I heard in about DC this in your well. interview with uh, Sterling Cooper. Sterling Cooper. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I talked about that a lot. Um, and so that's where, you know, after, after my first marriage, that's, that's where I, I dated was in mm. that scene for boss up in DC. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so all my partners were, were from that scene pretty much until I left DC earlier this year. Um, they up until I'd say the past couple of years. Right. So working away, end up, uh, end up getting married again to a young lady who was actually from my, my, my hometown in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of why that kind of how we what? Have that connection yeah Brandon, okay so Brandon, i see you met like i'm from here you too like kind yeah, of thing. That kind <laughs> of thing. yeah yeah and so the first uh mention of hometown <laughs> yeah it was, it was a bit more of a contentious relationship than that but um but yeah that was definitely the the hook that kind of got me through the door that mm-hmm. that, that let us actually start building something together and we were together for like six and a half almost seven years um got divorced in 2018 beginning of that um started dating another young lady pretty much uh not too long after she and i after my first wife second wife and i had separated um that lasted for about a year and a half mm-hmm. and that was after that ended it's like okay the bdsm scene and everything it's, had kind of changed a lot um which kind of talked about during my interview with sterling it's like okay those are no longer my people i don't want to be dating there anymore so i had to figure mm-hmm. out okay here i am at like 43 44 years old mm-hmm and I now have to figure out dating in 2019. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not having had to date normally. Mm-hmm. Basically ever. I mean, because high school doesn't fucking count as normal, right? College doesn't count as normal. Yeah. Got married in the Marine Corps. And I wouldn't then, know because I, I didn't do dating in high school. <laughs> right. But like, it, it's definitely not the real yeah, world. Yeah, no, I get right? it. You're not, you're not, not just an adult, not in the professional world, not where you actually have to go out and meet people and stuff like that. Yeah, right? yeah. So, mm-hmm. And then everybody else that I dated ever since my first wife was in that BDSM and King space. So it was all just like social contacts, right? Wow. Everybody's coming in and all that sort of stuff. So I never had uh, to go out and do dating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Never had to. Now I've got to like figure out what the fuck tender is and yeah, all that I'm kind of stuff. Oh <laughs> my God. That was such a disaster. <laughs> Like DC has a reputation of being like a really hard, really difficult dating market. Really kind of. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't. I had um, no idea. Yeah, definitely. If you if you look at some of the the pickup artist stuff, like from Rush and so forth and so on, a lot of people talk about mm-hmm. how rough DC is. Um, just it's it's a mess for dating, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm getting like zero fucking success, and it's just like an absolute shit show. Um, mm-hmm. So that's when I started getting back into the red pill stuff. You know, I started back into, into back into well, I had started I had started back in oh, 2007, 2008, 2009 mm. kind of time frame, sort of like dipping my toes in the pickup world and and read uh, Russian mail for the first time back then. Did you um, read the, the game by Neil Strauss first or like was that um, something? I don't think I ever read the game by Neil Strauss. Like I read uh-huh. some of the mystery method stuff, um, uh-huh. but it's much more the rational mail and the, the yeah. mm-hmm. stuff rather than the pickup stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and having picked up some of that knowledge was how I, how I ended up uh, dating and marrying my second wife. Uh huh. But I had never actually done any of the deep internal work to fix the stuff that was wrong. Yeah. I just like mm-hmm. got enough skills to get the, the hottest woman I'd ever been with. I'm like, all right, cool. Now I got my hottest one settling down. Right. Yeah. And went right back to, to making all the same mistakes that you do mm-hmm. in relationships. Right. Mm-hmm. So after, you know, when we were starting having difficulties, my second wife and I, you know, that's when I started dipping my toes back into the space and kind of rereading and getting more familiar with, mm-hmm. you know, Rola Tomasi and mm-hmm. started getting into Ryan Stone and so forth and so on. And so that's when I started really getting into, you know, the male self-improvement space, you know, mm-hmm. on the different Facebook groups. I got introduced to John from Modern Life Dating in uh, mm-hmm. quarter three of 2019, right? And started, you know, really starting to take a hard look at myself and what I was doing and why things weren't working. 
right? Mm-hmm. And that was that was an uncomfortable that was an uncomfortable period of time. Oh, I imagine so. Having having people show you know held at that mirror and say, okay, this is why you're fucked up, and this is why you're fucked up, and you don't fuck uh-huh. this thing, and this is what you're fucked up. At. Yeah, yeah. If you ever join, uh, you know, John's body, uh, body language mastery course, he's got all the the previous uh, webinars up on. Yeah. Up no, I, 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 I back remember. To three. I remember go back and look at me. I, yeah, just getting my fucking ass handed to me. Oh, it's so, it's, you know, it's so interesting oh, yeah. because, you know, like I remember hearing in your Sterling Cooper interview that that's where you got started with it. And, you know, like you hear the title body ma- uh, mastery, uh, language mm-hmm. mastery. You don't think that it's like a whole fucking like, you know, like I would enter into that thinking I was safe. And then like, you know, they're holding mirrors up to you about how fucked up you are. Like that's, yeah. that's well, a lot of it is. <laughs> it's well, like no, it's, 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 it's definitely, <laughs> yeah, 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 but no, it, 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 I get what you're saying. Cause the course was about a body language mastery. Here's all the yeah. body language cues so you can like understand more where she's at so you can calibrate your approach. And your I, I came here to learn body language, not to, not to do internal work. Yeah, like, yeah. And then <laughs> the webinars were all about like, you know, how to, how to date and systems for dating and so forth and so on. Uh-huh. Like, you know, how to, how to get your profiles together for the online dating and do dating mm-hmm. and so forth and so on. What, what is that yeah. saying where it's like uh, under promise over deliver in a sense? Yeah. 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 Very much so. Very, very much mm-hmm. so. Um, so you start asking questions like, okay, this is what I'm doing. What am I doing wrong? And they start mm-hmm. telling you. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> At least saying, I'm saying. It has a lot more to do with body sense. language. It has a lot more to do. Yeah. And so you start, you know, in a lot of ways you start realizing that it's not, necessarily about you know the profile itself or the photos or what you said yeah. on the date that there's a lot of shit going on with you that you need mm-hmm. to take a look at and unfuck before you're actually yeah. able to get what you want right mm-hmm. it's like approach anxiety right you're afraid of going up and talking to girls great why right? yeah what's you know what's what's going on in your head that makes that so scary right? mm-hmm. yeah, yeah some people are doing it like it's nothing nobody's business some people are having a really hard time with it right yeah. Some people mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, here's my photos from Twitter. It's like, dude, like you're 350 pounds. What the fuck are you doing? Were you at like, like a overweight? No, no, no. Or? I mean, no, no. You just give a general not, example. Yeah. yeah, just general examples, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Me, mm-hmm. like my style was shit. You know, my clothes weren't weren't tailored and fitted well, and mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know, my haircut wasn't wasn't the best. You know, my style mm-hmm. was just off. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you mm-hmm. need to unfuck all this shit. It's like I like that stuff. I'm like, I know you like that stuff, but you can either like that stuff or you can get laid. What do you want? Well, it's it's very interesting because <laughs> for me, like you know, like uh, I hold you know to a lot of the the, the things that uh, like I walk or not now because it's freezing cold, but like I've been going walking barefoot everywhere for like the sure. past like half year. And, you know, making approaches and all that. And like, for me, the, like, you know, the, the approach anxiety thing was just not practicing enough. I found like just doing it, you know, like a few times and it's like all of a sudden starts to lift. But like, you know, I guess it's like a kind of a balance. You know, they say like, you know, uh, you have to have like either two or three of money looks in game. Um, and uh, I think like, you know, at, at least I hope that like the uh, the the looks and game is enough to uh, allow me to retain uh, the 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 style that I enjoy, which is very sure. basic, you know, like t shirt, yeah, you know. <laughs> here's or, here's here's part of the thing. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. you are being judged on how you look and how you how yeah. you look conveys. It's a signal theory, right? You're 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 giving signals. You're telling the world about who you are by how you dress and how you act. And how yeah, you that's right, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So cool. You like running around, you know, barefoot and jeans and a t-shirt. Perfectly mm-hmm. fine. Um, is that going to work in like downtown financial district? Probably fucking not. Cause you look like, um, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, for me, the thing was on a beach and like, in like fucking Bali, that's going to go over really well. Yeah. Yeah. But also right. I guess like in a city, an urban city, it's like, you already have a bunch of weirdos over here. Yeah. And like, it's also like uh, kind of makes you stand out. You know, I remember like I went out like a Tinder date where I had a picture of barefoot, like, and then when she uh, came up to me and she was like, Oh, you really do go barefoot everywhere. I was like, yeah, I'm like, I do. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it was fucking yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. I think it's also but, about like, like owning certain things, you know, yeah. like uh, not being ashamed, like, you know, but, uh, Again, it's multiple factors, you know. Oh God, yes, yeah, and mm-hmm. and like that was really where I really started digging into the more mental aspects of things, right? Mm-hmm. And and realizing like how much 
shit that I was still carrying around that I never yeah. looked at and never dealt with. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's how I got into hypnosis. One of the guys in one of the body language mastery courses was a hypnotist up in, up here in Dallas, actually. Mm-hmm. I was talking about things like toxic shame and emotional baggage. I'm like, well, Catholic, got a lot of that, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> part of, part, part I hear uh, exactly, right? all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so I did some hypnosis with him and just got rid of a bunch of shit. And I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And, like, having done that little bit of work was enough to create a space to do a lot of shit. Create it, 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 well, it, oh. it made it so everything that I was doing was definitely easier. Mm-hmm. I didn't have, I wasn't carrying as much weight, so I wasn't as fucking held down, so I could be, I could act more freely. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, if you're walking around with a backpack full, you know, 50 pounds worth of shit, mm-hmm. it's good. Everything's going to be harder to do. Take the backpack off, set it down. All of a sudden, everything's easier to do. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the only thing you've done is like take off some fucking weight. You haven't made mm-hmm. any other changes to yourself. Right. So That's just right. that mm-hmm. was enough to create enough space for me to make some really interesting things. Mm-hmm. So I ended up like starting to date this girl who was half my age. You know, I was uh-huh. 44. She was 22 years old, met her on Tinder and great girl. Yeah. And we spent two years together up until wow. I, I moved down here to Texas. You know, um, oh, you moved to Texas. I moved to Texas in September of this year. So are you still in yeah. Texas? Where? I am. Uh, I'm Where? down in Austin. Dude, man, like I, I'm probably moving back to Austin in March. Perfect. We'll have to like hang out then. Definitely. Get fucking up absolutely, dude. I mean, this is so crazy. Like, yeah. you know, when bef- the last five years I spent in uh, in the U.S. before I moved to Israel mm-hmm. was in Austin. Yeah, and it's a great fucking town. It's fucking awesome, and like you know, and 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 it's like you know. I've always like I refer to it as, as home, like you know, like I say, like to people, like I'm I'm going back home because like I just it it just feels that way. I mean, it's yeah, fucking yeah. crazy. Like I can't believe you said that. fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'll get to that in just a minute because I kind of want to like bring in some more elements before I get there because mm-hmm. um, that's very mm-hmm. emotional about um, you know in the contracting world. I'm working in the in the red pill space now. Uh, get my first hypnosis session. It's pretty fascinating stuff for me, right? And at the time, I was definitely getting more, just more and more dissolution with being a contractor and kind of like how much I was sacrificing, how little I was getting in return. And Mm -hmm. I had kind of moved on from doing a lot of the really cool and interesting work that I had done and was doing much more like project management stuff and administrative stuff and kind of, Mm -hmm. I moved up enough that I didn't get to do as much of the cool shit that I used to get to do. So I wasn't getting as much satisfaction from what I was doing in terms of like day-to-day work and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, recognizing more and more how much I was sacrificing and stuff like that and how big of an impact it was having on my life um, in terms of like how I had to live my life, you know, Mm -hmm. traveling all the fucking time, yada, yada, and just no stability. And so I was kind of looking around for the next big thing. Mm -hmm. And after like watching Ryan Stone and watching Rich Cooper and watching John, um, kind of wanting to get into that space of, of helping other people. Right? Mm-hmm. Cause my folks, you know, my mother is a mortgage broker, so she does, um, reverse mortgages. So for older people who they own their home and they got a lot of equity and it basically taken out yeah. so they can get monthly income. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause if you're living on social security and you're eating fucking can, you know, cat food instead of tuna, tuna or whatever it is, like a couple hundred bucks a month extra, it's really gonna make a big difference for you. Oh, for sure. Not having to make a house payment. Right. Yeah. And my dad runs a, runs a nonprofit. So he helps, uh, underprivileged kids like get out in nature and go hunting and fishing and stuff like that and find mentors and things like that really cool. oh, it's kind of in your blood like uh the yeah, yeah. Uh, service uh, to others yeah, yeah. exactly uh-huh. and so and i was sitting there and i was looking at myself and kind of how, how dissatisfied i was with what i what i had going on and looking at my folks and looking at my brother who's a financial planner mm-hmm. um and just how much satisfaction they got out of you know having that interpersonal connection yeah you know, mm-hmm. having that having that being able to like sit across from study and say, I help this person's life, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of the work that I've been doing for up until then was very abstract, working with shit across the, across the fucking globe, like maybe something happens, maybe something doesn't. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm lucky a couple of years from now, something will change. Like, you mm-hmm. know, so abstract and there's just such, such a distance between you and the people you're, you're working on and impacting. Like mm-hmm. it, it's just such, you know, having- It's very rewarding. Like, impact. It's rewarding, but it's so abstract, right? Yeah, because it, it's like further removed. It's kind of like that video so game far, uh, right. concept, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm sitting there kind of like, okay, well, maybe I just want to start working with and helping with people, right? But I'm like, I have no fucking experience in this space. Never mm-hmm. done any coaching, never done anything like that. So I'd actually thought mm-hmm. about becoming a psychologist. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So I was looking around for grad schools and stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, it's going to be six years to get my PhD. Mm -hmm. It'd be like 300, 400 grand in costs, Mm -hmm. right? And I'm not going to be able to even really be able to start my new career until I'm like 50. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. It's <laughs> a very fucking unappealing concept, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do the same. That's, that's more for like, like you know when uh, like uh, you know older people like go to college just because they have nothing to do. But like right. you, you weren't there yet. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, I was I was definitely looking for what am I going to do next. You know, mm-hmm. so you know that 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 idea of having to wait six years before I could really start doing what I want to do was massively unappealing, especially since I still have to be working. Yeah. Uh, and also, and like, time, given your experience, like, like, given your previous experience in college, like, you know, it might not have been so pleasant and yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might have like worked I, out I, the same. Well, I finally finished out my degree, like, uh, what, 2006 or so, you know, okay. just, to, just, just to check that box, you know, just uh-huh. I, I hopped on to whatever online courses I needed to. Yeah. You know, Sunday, my, my assignments were due Sunday evening, so I'd start my school work like Sunday, 7 o'clock at mm-hmm. night, you know, just yeah. let that shit out fucking... Mm. just checking the box right I yeah didn't even fucking it wasn't it didn't mean anything more than checking the box right so mm-hmm. I didn't like tick mark on my resume but um you know i had done the, res- the session with ryan valor and was like you know this hypnosis thing is really fascinating yeah and i can get certified as a hypnotist in like mm-hmm. 100 hours of training a couple grand mm-hmm. like fuck it let's give this a shot mm-hmm. right yeah that way I'll, number one, I'll know hypnosis. Number two, I'll be able to start like working with clients one one and figure out if that's even something I want to do. Yeah, right? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if that's something that's actually going to give me anything that I want, or if dealing with people's problems is going to be more of a pain in the ass than I want to manage. Right? Yeah, because mm-hmm. I had started studying law my first year of uh, you know way back when in college. Uh, I studied law for a little while, and then I kind of looked around at a bunch of lawyers and said, "I don't want to fucking live that life, and I don't mm-hmm. want to, have to deal with the kind of people the lawyers have to deal with." Mm-hmm. So the, even though I enjoyed the law and I enjoyed arguing, I probably would have been a pretty good lawyer. Like I didn't want to fucking have to deal with those people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah, that is not the career path. And and it's also like the you know such an overabundance of lawyers. Like, uh, oh yeah, th- this is something that you know I learned a long time ago. Is that like be, uh, going to school for being a lawyer is one of the worst options a person can have because the competition is so great. And then like you end up doing like, you know, not the kind of like glorified legal uh, lawyer work that you see on uh, law and order, but more like paperwork and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And I mean, hats off to people who want to do that and go down that road. It's just, mm-hmm. that was just not going to be my choice. Right. Yeah. So January and February, 2020, I get certified as hypnotist. Um, mm-hmm. And I find out that I've got, I got a talent for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's just something about it that just seems yeah. pretty comes pretty easily to me, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, the beer bug hits. You know, March the 2020, what? everything good. You know, the beer bug hits. The pandemic hits. March 2020. Oh, okay. You call right, it the, so be- now, the beer bug? The beer bug. The Why do you call it that? Corona. Corona beer. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you got censored off of YouTube if you said anything about that. So people were calling the beer bug or the beer virus and stuff. Like I that. totally missed there. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So. You know, so now I've got all this time on my hands and I'm like, all mm-hmm. right, so I went ahead and started up, you know, offer my services as a hypnotist back in like April of last year mm-hmm. and started doing some initial work with clients and seeing it's like, okay, I'm getting some results for people. You know, I'm actually yeah. making a bit of a difference. Um, but the initial training that I got was kind of insufficient, right? Mm-hmm. So went and got some more training and kind of built out my own methodology and kind of launched for real in May of last year mm-hmm. and started having some serious success, like having an impact, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm still working my regular job while I'm doing this stuff. So I'm mm-hmm. working, you know, 80, 90 hour weeks on average at that point. Um, and over and what summer, was the regular I, job? I, did you mention this? Still doing, still doing the contracting job at that point. Oh, okay, right? okay. So okay. still uh-huh. doing that Yeah, as mm-hmm. well as doing this. And I'm helping out John with his, uh, his webinars at this point, you know, mm-hmm. and just got a lot of stuff going on. And in September of last year, um, went out to Vegas for uh, a three-day hypnosis seminar uh, mm-hmm. on erotic hypnosis, right? Mm-hmm. And great seminar, had a lot of fun, really mm-hmm. cool stuff. And but one of the one of the really fascinating insights I kind of had as, as as part of that thing was like, you know, shit, I really love doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. I have to mm-hmm. make a choice. Yeah, I have to make a choice. I can't do this and yeah, yeah, my regular job mm-hmm. anymore. Like, I, there's fucking mm-hmm. not enough time. I'm burning myself out. This is just not mm-hmm. not doable. So I decided to quit my job, came back from Vegas and walked in that, you know, that, that Tuesday morning and said, Hey, uh, just to let you know, I'm turning in my 30 days notice. 
Mm. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was yeah. Just, it was another one of those moments where, like, you know, this had a moment of clarity of, like, this is what I, this is a decision I need to make. This is where I'm And given, you know, how you explained it before, I mean, like, did you have any fear? It's just like, all right, this is the idea and I'm going forward. No, no, there was, there wasn't any, there wasn't any fear about making the choice. There was mm. definitely some trepidation because like, fuck, I've been in public service for 23 years. I never fucking run a business before. Yeah. You know, mm. I was having some success, right? And I was making some money, but like not anywhere close to what I was making. Yeah, I was making about half of what I was with my regular job, mm. right? So it's like, now I have to, you know, as of October 2020, that's my only source of income. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, now yeah. I really got to figure shit out, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's, that's still been something that's, uh, you know, 2021 was an extremely successful year. There's definitely a lot of things I need to, need to fix uh, on the business side of things to really kind mm -hmm. of make it what I need it to be and have the sustainability yeah. and, and the mm -hmm. flow and stuff like that. But that's, those are problems that can be solved. I just need to be able to. to both yeah, I mean, to. I mean, to me, it's it's quite amazing that you know, if, if I remember correctly, you know, May twenty nineteen, that's when you got introduced to hypnosis with uh, with John Allen. Yeah, that's what I remember hearing in the story. November, November, I think it was. Yeah, November. Okay, and like now we're in November twenty twenty one. Oh wait, we're December. December. Yeah, I'm twenty two. I'm dyslexic, uh, yeah. and and it's like you have like propelled so fucking fast oh yeah and like you and you uh, caught on like quite a r strong reputation you know i mean like the testimonials that you know like people speak of you you know like in particular uh john the fin from modern life dating you know i mean like just like it, it, just to see his transformation like is is fascinating to me because like uh, you know, like I, I, I appreciate like, you know, the majority of the red pill guys and I've always had an appreciation for John, but like, you know, his style is very different than like, like his, like things that he likes are not my like uh, aim, you know, right. like I'm a very right. basic guy, no Versace, like, like, you know, teachers, not Versace, Louis Vuitton, good shit, yeah. but like, you know, like, like before hypnosis, like he was very kind of like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like shallow in a sense. And like, you know, at least the, what, the things he was talking about in uh, his, uh, uh, you know, uh, podcast and like all his things. But then like after that, it's like, man, like he started talking about trauma. He started talking about like the hard stuff, like having like a, a, a whole month where it's just like we're not doing any of this, like, you know, like easy chick, like, uh, like, you know, it's style stuff, July, like yeah. all yeah, inner game July. And like, you know, just to see like, and I think he said they did like eight uh, sessions with you or something like that. Oh, so there's, there's myself and there's Ryan Fowler. So there's actually two Ryans doing hypnosis in that space. So he's okay, so, with both of us, right? So, so I thought he said with you eight that he did, but how, uh, um, we've done, we've done several together. I don't think it's eight, but he's okay. Not, he's so maybe he meant combined. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, like the results, like they're so evident, like, you know, like from anybody who followed him for any amount of time, even not closely, you know, yeah. it's just like a fucking like almost mind blowing to just see that yeah. kind of thing. And then to kind of experience it myself is, you know, another thing that we'll get into as well. But like, uh, man, like, you know, you, you have, you know, you were on with Paul Benjamin, like, yep. you know, Sterling Cooper. And just like, uh, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's just like, uh, it, 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 you, you've really cemented yourself in such a short period of time. Like, that is fucking amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One thing I've noticed, um, especially in like the YouTube era and, and the modern age, is that if you know what the hell you're doing and if you've yeah. got a skill, like, yeah. it is very, very easy. Mm -hmm. to become very well known very quickly because all you have to mm -hmm. do is say, Hey, mm -hmm. here, I'm good at this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all I got to be able to do is like demonstrate that, that ability and show people like, no, I'm actually, yeah. I can actually make this shit happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You do that. And there's, and there's people, there's people who will pay attention. And mm -hmm. especially in this space, man, like if you look not just at the red pill, but just kind of like the, the male self-improvement space as a whole, mm -hmm. the guys just trying to fix their shit. Right. Yeah. There are so many people trying to find answers to these problems yeah right yeah and so they're going down all kinds of different fucking rabbit holes to find mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah so if you've got 
a clear message. If you're talking about problems in a way mm-hmm. that's unique, if you're talking about problems in a way of like, you're having this issue, this is where it starts and here's what's happening and here's how to fix it. Like, yeah. Start paying attention. You know? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and well, it's interesting, is, it's yeah, interesting what you said, like, you know, the thing about like, you know, people like uh, searching for solutions, you know, mm-hmm. for so long, you know, like I, I was uh, hanging out with, you know, a buddy of mine and he's pretty much my closest friend here in Israel. Mm-hmm. And he said this like twice, but like it was last night and he was like, he said to me, like, you know, it was so hard watching you, like, you know, uh, trying to find answers, like, and, and just constantly falling back into this like addiction issues, you know, like, like, you know, everything going really well. And then like things are getting to the point of like really fucking good. And it's like, Oh, it's too good. And then all of a sudden, like I'm fucking destroying everything yeah, in like a drug binge. And it's not even like, you know, a, like a, 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 like a drug weekend or a day or this or that. It's just like, it was just like fucking excessive, you know? And, and it's just like, you know, like I'm, uh, I'm an articulate person, intelligent, like, you know, and, 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 and I, I was able to improve this guy's life substantially, but then he's looking at me like fucking like you know he came over once i was like uh, fucking sticking needles in my arm i couldn't find a vein i had blood running all down me and and he's like what the fuck is going on here like you know like it's it's fucking like uh, and and so yeah yeah it's just that's exactly his observation like yeah Yeah, and the thing is like people's problems are so varied and the the root causes of stuff are so varied, right? And so it can take a long fucking time to figure stuff out. And Mm -hmm. and I want to say right up front, like I am not the guy with all the answers. Like hypnosis Mm -hmm. is not a magic wand. Like this is not the tool that everybody should be using to fix every problem. Like Mm -hmm. some Mm -hmm. people say that I'm not that guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple things that, that I always try to keep in mind. One is actually uh, a phrase that I learned from a, Mm -hmm. from a hedge fund guy up in New York. uh, Mm -hmm. Barry Ritholtz, he said, you know, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Uh-huh. Right. That, like, I, that, that's interesting. I don't even quite get Incredibly that. profound. All models right? like, he's, he's, every single model, every single, like, mm-hmm. like 12-step program or, like, yeah. uh, you use uh-huh. cold showers to fix stuff or whatever that happens. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's an abstraction of the world. Uh-huh. Right? An abstraction of the world so that you can actually understand a complex thing in a very simple way. Yeah, yeah, Re- reduction. That, that's uh, like reduction. Yeah, it's, it's a map. Yeah, it's a, it's mm-hmm. a map, right? It's an abstraction mm-hmm. of the terrain, right? Mm-hmm. And then based on that that map, that abstraction, you create solutions based on that theory. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, they're all wrong because they're all missing details because they're abstractions, not the actual thing, right? Yeah, some of them are useful, mm-hmm. right? So if you look at a twelve step program, for example, um, is it necessarily great at solving addiction? No, not at all. It turns out, you know, and it definitely works for some people, definitely doesn't for others, right? Worse so better yeah. and worse for some people. Do you want to hear the statistics people, right? on that? <laughs> it's very um, for, Yeah, yeah, I bet it probably is. But like the point being that there's definitely pieces of it that work. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Does it solve things the way it, it's supposed to? No, mm-hmm. probably not. Is it actually mm-hmm. looking at some of the root causes the way it needs to? Probably not. Are some really good things in there that make these people's lives better? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm, better than yeah, nothing. Yeah. Fuck yes, right? Mm, yeah. So you start looking at you know things from that perspective of like, okay, these are all abstractions. I need to find the right abstraction that actually addresses what's going on with. Mm-hmm. Right? And the other piece is that symptoms aren't problems. That's right. Mm-hmm. Right? Symptoms yeah. aren't problems. The mm-hmm. Addiction mm-hmm. issues you had. That's yeah. not a problem. That's a symptom. yeah. It's the outer layer. That's the outer layer, right? It's like pain isn't a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Your body says, hey, this fucking hurts to call your attention to something that needs to be fixed. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. People are focusing mm-hmm. on the pain. So it's like, well, let me take some Advil, let me take some Oxy, whatever, but so I don't hurt anymore. Yeah. Instead of trying to figure out, okay, why do I hurt? What's wrong? What's going on? Right. It's like putting a band aid on a bullet wound. <laughs> putting a band aid on a bullet wound, right? And stuff like that. Right. And so it can, do, it can take a while to do the investigative work to figure out what's actually going on. Right? Mm-hmm. And there's a million people out there telling you a million different reasons why something's happening. It's your inner child. It's like money blocks. It's abundance things. It's fucking yeah. parental, parental issues. It's past life shit, right? It's <laughs> I hate that karma, stuff. right? You know? <laughs> Millions of different things, right? And, mm-hmm. and the thing is, like, all of them probably have a grain of truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know? Like most things in life do. Truth. Exactly. Take religion, exactly. for example. You got tons of great truths mixed with lies, you know, or, yeah, exactly. or, or whatever you want to call it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but there's there's definitely like pieces of it that are good and pieces of it that are probably bullshit, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, in a lot of ways, it's about trying to figure out what model you mo- you understand best, so you can actually mm-hmm. leverage it to fix the problem that's going on. Mm-hmm. Right? For me, I look I work very much from a, a more behavioral perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like my 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 model is that like everything you do has a purpose. Uh-huh. All that you know, like your unconscious mind is running ninety percent of your life. Yeah, all that shit it does is on purpose. Uh-huh, it exists uh-huh. for a fucking reason, right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. your brain is fundamentally lazy. It's not going to do stuff that doesn't have a purpose. Mm-hmm. So if you're shooting yourself in the foot all the time by blowing your life up every time things get good, yeah. there's a reason for that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your brain's trying to solve a problem. So all mm-hmm. we got to do is figure out what the hell the problem is. It's trying to solve and why it thinks this is a good way to solve it. Mm-hmm. As soon as we do that, then we can get you a different solution. Yeah. Right. So and, and that's so- fundamentally what mm-hmm. my work is. Yeah. And, and so one thing that, you know, like uh, that, that I was very impressed with and kind of caught off guard with, um, you know, so like uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about like the first sure. hypnosis ex- uh, experience I had with uh, another therapist who shall remain nameless. Uh, like, you know, it was um, like it was, a, uh, you know, it was a free session and like it was like kind of like a, a very long one. Uh, but it was a lot of interviewing and talking about like like a lot of things like you know that were uh just like kind of like that that i really figured out through your hypnosis session were really irrelevant and uh one thing that you know like i i kind of realized because uh, you know like he was uh um you know he was trying to sell me like an eight week like coaching and hypnosis uh program uh for like five thousand bucks right so it's like, you know, like, okay, so you got these problems, like, let's spread it over eight weeks and 5,000 bucks. But then when I had the, the hypnosis session with you, like, I like I, I was totally caught off guard because like I had this other experience. And then here you are cutting out all the bullshit and just getting straight to the fucking point. And so I realized here that like, you know, like, there's a, you know, I, I have a real problem with grifters right you know people who just like you know just fucking take advantage or whatever but like and i can't say this guy was really a grifter but it's just like like okay you it didn't need to be that much because like i got you know first off it changed my life that session but like it was like all, only like halfway kind of thing and then, right. then it was like the session with you was like the other half in a sense i, I there could be other stuff that needs to be uh to be um uh worked on but so it was me, like mm-hmm. yeah let me get into this a bit and kind of explain a little bit of the difference between different kinds of ways of using hypnosis and different methods yeah. right because mm-hmm. here's the thing like hypnosis in and of itself is just an altered state of mind where you yeah. can access the unconscious mind mm-hmm. that's it right that's mm-hmm. all hypnosis is right i thought it was what more simple do, than that but okay what you what you do once you're there that's yeah. The magic that's the technique that's the that's the difference right mm-hmm. so a lot of hypnotists you know the vast majority of them are trained very much on indirect work and it's metaphor work and stuff like that where it's like yeah. okay you bring me a problem like your problem is addiction great i'm gonna address yeah. the addiction right mm-hmm. i'm gonna talk about how you don't have to use drugs or like this is bad mm-hmm. and that's this is good and so forth and so on yeah and so a lot of the interview stuff that you do is trying to figure out the pieces of your life that need mm-hmm. to be pulled into that you know, like, okay, these are triggers for you, so let's address these triggers, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's talking about, like, giving you different, giving your mind different frameworks and different ways of, you know, like, instead, like, talk about, uh, you know, having a hard time taking, you know, do, doing things that are risky. And mm-hmm. so I give you a metaphor about, well, like, hey, if you're a climber, that's really dangerous. You can fall and you can fucking die, but you got these ropes, you got these crampons, you get these different tools. Mm-hmm. Because of all these tools, you can take this risk and you're still safe if something goes wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Now it's like, okay, even if I'm doing risky things, I can still be safe to do it, right? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. The thing with that is it's basically kind of like doing affirmations. It's just mm-hmm. like a powerful methodology. So you yeah. need some repetition. Right? Mm-hmm. You need some repetition of that to really get that stuff installed, all right? Mm-hmm. The reason why I don't like that approach is you can. it doesn't actually figure out what the problem is. Mm-hmm. It's just giving you a different way of looking at things. That yeah, gives you a different choice to make, right? That gives your mind uh-huh. a different choice to make, right? Uh-huh. But if you look at like any any decision or any behavior, it's kind of like a set of scales, right? Yeah, you got mm-hmm. positive things on one side, got negative things on another, right? Mm-hmm. So on the positive side, it's like uh, 
you know, you want to live a good life and you want to be happy and so forth and so on. On the negative side, like you have all the mm-hmm. self-destructive shit of like you, you're not supposed to be fucking alive and all this other stuff, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Regular hypnosis is a lot of piling stuff up on the positive side and hoping that's, that tips the scales. Mm-hmm. Makes sense, right? Throw enough shit mm-hmm. on the other side. Yeah. To the scales, right? But what if on the other, on the uh, negative side you have, if you do this, you will fucking die. Mm-hmm. How much positive shit do you have to throw on the other side of the scale to outbalance that? <laughs> right? Yeah. Or how about you have like, you don't fucking deserve this? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. How much shit do you have to pile on the other side to outweigh that? You know? Yeah. It's so like, from it, my it's perspective, nothing, yeah. yeah, like it's, 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 it's an incredibly difficult task to do and you might yeah. not ever get there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because if, because the other thing is like, okay, if you look at it from the behavioral standpoint of your mind is trying to accomplish a particular objective by doing this stuff, it's like, okay, mm-hmm. you took away one tool from me. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. I'm going to grab another tool. Don't want to smoke mm-hmm. anymore. Not a problem. We'll stir your hair away. Take away the heroin. Great. Not a problem. I'll just get you addicted to sex. Go, sex goes away. Not a problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's gambling. Yeah. Yeah. It's focusing on the find, again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, uh, because each of those things isn't, it's not the, the gambling is not the problem. The gambling is just mm-hmm. the tool your mind is using to, to, to achieve a particular objective. Mm-hmm. So if you take away one tool, I'm just going to find another tool to achieve that same objective. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it's much better, at least my my personal opinion is like, okay, let me go figure out what this is supposed to be doing. Why mm-hmm. are you addicted to stuff? Why do you keep on going back to shit? What the fuck mm-hmm. does this actually do for you? Yeah, yeah. Why do you keep shooting yourself? Why do you let yourself have a good life and then blow it up? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. There's a purpose. Right. Mm-hmm. So if I've got direct access to your unconscious mind because we're in hypnosis, I just get to ask that question. I'm like, okay, cool. Why? Yeah. Like, uh-huh. What the hell is the problem that you're trying to solve here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you have to understand, like, I spent 23 years trying to figure out shit that people didn't want me to find out. Yeah. Uh-huh. I spent 23 years putting together puzzles where half the pieces were missing. Yeah. So yeah. when I'm talking to somebody and, mm-hmm. and they don't know what's going on because it's not your conscious mind that's making decisions, it's your unconscious mind. And that shit's running on its mm-hmm. own fucking program you can't see. Mm-hmm. So I can sit there and we can have a two hour long interview and you can tell me why you think the problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And like you mm-hmm. tell me your life story and like this is why I'm all fucked up. I'm like, great. So yeah. go the fuck to sleep. Let me actually talk to who's running into the show and have him mm-hmm. tell me. Yeah, well, it's it, often it, very fucking different from the one you've been telling yourself. Yeah, and and it's right. interesting because like um, you know I and you know I, I was slightly on target where I thought these issues were coming from. You know, I I, I really pinned them uh, strongly on abandonment, right? Sure. Uh, but like that's really interesting because because like you know you had uh, you, you went to three scenarios, mm-hmm. and you know the first one was really interesting for me because like. You know, and this is where I was really caught. Uh, another thing that I was really caught off guard by, because like, you know, the uh, the first scene was like me in the snow and like, you know, and nobody's around, you know. But the thing is, like, it wasn't a scene from that I ever actually remember being in. And like the 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 other aspect of it was when I saw myself there. I didn't see myself as me. I saw Calvin from the, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes because that was like my childhood thing. Like up until now, I still break those uh, comics out and read them like every couple of years. And so I was like, kind of like, oh my God, what is my brain doing here? Like, like, you know, how, is, how, how, like, like, this isn't even me. Like, you know, it's making up stories and, and all these kind of things. And then the, I'm going to skip over the second exam and the third one into the, like the synagogue uh you know scenery well that was an abandonment issue that that was like you know a control issue and dominance issue whatever and so like uh it really is spun me for a little bit but then like you know later on like while the session's still going i thought of a fourth example like no enough examples but that fourth example you had already pinned what that like in the other three uh and so like one thing that i wanted to ask you is like you know like how how, what, how would you uh, what would you say to somebody who's like coming to hypnosis for you? Like, what is the best way for them to prepare what to expect? Like, so that they um, if they see a scene where it's like something like, oh, like that didn't happen. Like, you know, that they're not like thinking in their mind, like, oh, this is wrong. Like, you know, or something like that. Like, like so mm-hmm. memory and recall are two different things. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Memory is the storage of the things that have happened in your life. And quite frankly, mm-hmm. like pretty much everything that's ever happened is perfectly stored in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. It's there. Mm-hmm. Whether or not your unconscious mind decides to give you access to it is a different story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. That's recall. Mm-hmm. 
So mm. the fact that you haven't recalled that memory and the fact that your mind was perhaps using some metaphors oh. and stuff to kind of tell that story, bucket irrelevant, doesn't mean it didn't yeah. happen. Uh-huh. Right? And it's like repressed so, memories. Well, not necessarily repressed memories, but mm. if your mind is trying to protect you and keep you safe and not trying to yeah. hurt you, why the fuck mm. would it show you shit that's going to hurt you? Well, that's, it, 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 here's the, the, you know, when you say that, because like, because uh, my mind for most of my life was constantly recalling painful memories because that pain was being used as a tool to cause an effect for you right ah. it was a stick that was using to beat you to keep you from doing things i right? see oh like putting myself down and like you yeah know, it's, like it's, it's discouragement okay. discouragement stay in your place right? you stay know in your place yada yada right mm-hmm. so again if you look at it from like a not a mechanistic standpoint, but from a behavioral standpoint of like, look at your, look at your unconscious mind as like a separate person or different party with his own fucking job. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This job is to keep you in place. So it's like, okay, cool. What tools do I have? I can't talk to you because mm-hmm. your unconscious mind isn't the part that's fucking making conscious language. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's off things like emotions and sensations and a heavy, heavy mm-hmm. sense in your, in your stomach. Right. Yeah. 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 It's got all the memories. So it's going to throw up all those fucking negative memories that you may say, remember mm-hmm. this, remember this, remember this. Yeah. Go fucking do that thing. I don't want you to do. Yeah. Protect yourself. <laughs> like- Protect yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's just using these different memories, these different mm-hmm. memories to influence your behavior and influence your choices. Mm-hmm. Cause it wants you to do X instead of Y. Mm-hmm right so yeah. of course it's going to show you stuff that's going to keep you from doing the thing it doesn't want to want you to do uh-huh but interestingly enough yeah when it doesn't have to do that to you anymore because this is no longer off limits what happens stuff like remember that shit stop getting bombarded with those thoughts yeah 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 because it doesn't have to beat you with the stick anymore because it's yours you can do the thing that's interesting i didn't think about that because you know what the one of the things that i did notice you know about uh what's been going on with me since our session was like you know there was this part where it was like you know uh like like a kind of like a drawing board or a window or whatever and then like you know writing on like having like a memory and then uh it fades to white and then you write like a a, a word on it. and the two words in my mind you know the first one was like strength and the other one was consistency and uh the thing that i noticed was that like you know like as like you know as like uh, for me in both of my hypnosis sessions uh, it really took like about two to three weeks to sink in. Is that common? Like for so so here's the pe- here's several okay a lot of things are kind of going on here um, mm-hmm. that you're talking about the different memories we visited. All that is is to help me get the actual story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? So mm-hmm. instead of talking to you for a couple hours and trying to yeah. piece it together based on your history, mm-hmm. cutting out the I just bullshit. go to the party yeah. mind and say, yeah. okay, show me show me the problem. So that mm-hmm. I understand what the problem is, right? So mm-hmm. once I have those different examples in your mind, yeah. I get to put, put together that puzzle mm-hmm. to make sure that I understand what the story it is that you've been telling yeah. yourself about all these things. Because it's mm-hmm. not the things that happen, it's the meaning you've been assigning to. It's the stories that you tell yeah. that mm-hmm. matter. Yeah. It's the, I'm hanging out on the stove because I've been abandoned because there's something fucking wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the piece that matters, right? Mm-hmm. That event doesn't matter. It's that meaning that you assign to it of, I'm fucking worthless. There's something wrong with me. I don't deserve yada, 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 right? I got to mm. be somebody else, whatever happens to be. Yeah. So my job is to like piece that together from those different examples and then make sure I've got it right. Confirm that, right? Yeah. Once we have that story, then we go mm. back and show it all the pieces that it missed, all the things it didn't understand at the time. Mm. Yeah. We get to show it a different perspective of how to interpret that event. Yes, that's right. By mm-hmm. doing that, by changing the story, we change the meaning, change the meaning, we change the way you have to react to it. Yeah, and yeah. Because what we're doing is we're saying, okay, you've got this whole complex of self-destructive behaviors. Yeah. This is the problem. I change this. Mm-hmm. I impact all of this. Yeah, yeah. Because all feel- of this flows from here. Right? Yeah. It's so all, it's all built on that same foundation, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're talking about how it kind of unfolds over a few weeks, yeah, yeah it takes time to see the differences in your life. The change yeah. has already been made, right? But uh-huh. then you have to go live your life. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's right. part of the thing that I kind of to mentioned that for feedback, you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so going on the life open, life. like being in the situations and all that, but the, the, all those the, little the, stimulus and seeing how things are different now, right? Yeah, so the, that's the where, of, that's that process you're seeing of like, mm-hmm. okay, now that you've changed this narrative, how are you now going to move through the world in response mm-hmm. to that stuff? Right? Yeah, who are you now? What are the new behaviors you're going to be manifesting? Mm-hmm. What are the new choices that you can make now that you can make new choices? Yeah, yeah, right. 
Mm -hmm. those are those changes you see unfolding over time. Like you'd already made those changes. Ah, so it's just the observation of the of the the choices the and being like ah, uh, yeah. it's already been made, but it's like you haven't been in the situation yet to be able to observe it. Exactly. Uh, I see. Exactly. Yeah. So, so for me, you know, what I noticed right away, and I'm noticing it up till now, is like you know, like uh, like you know, th those uh, kind of negative thoughts uh, that I had, uh, kind of like you know, putting myself down and like you know, like uh, just like just you know, negative thinking. Like the the words come up, and then it's like there for like a, like maybe a, a second or two, and then it just fucking like vanishes. It just it goes into the background, and I notice that right away. And it's still to the, to now. It's just like you know, like it, it, like like negative thinking. It's like the, the, so the brain. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Let me go ahead and explain what's going on here. Okay. So yeah. Part mm -hmm. of the part of the session, what we did was uh, a technique I like to call the gallery exercise. The guy who taught it to me. Mm -hmm. he, the resource organizer, right? Yeah. And all it is is a technique to allow your unconscious mind to take a memory. Yeah. And instead of carrying around all that emotional baggage, it's like, okay, just let me pull out the lesson I need to remember from that event. Yeah. Get rid of the rest of the shit, right? Mm -hmm. So as you remember these painful memories, one of the suggestions that I use in hypnosis is at mm -hmm. any time in the future, yeah, painful lesson, positive memory might come to mind. Do the same thing. Just pull out the lesson, get rid of the rest of the shit. Yeah, yeah. And once you've got that lesson, all the way to back of your mind, safely in your past where it belongs. Mm -hmm. So your unconscious mind is using that exact technique as you've been taught to use it to do uh -huh. exactly what you've been taught to do. Uh -huh. As these different memories come to mind that didn't get processed for whatever reason at that time, mm -hmm. it's doing the same thing. It's just getting rid of all that emotional bullshit, yeah. taking out the small lesson that it needs to remember, the positive lesson that it needs to remember so that it can actually you know, move through those situations better the next time. Mm -hmm. Got that? Cool. Lock it in. Don't mm -hmm. even think about that shit anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's just your mind doing exactly that same exercise, that same process. Yeah. Whenever you're noticing it, it's like, oh, interesting. It just goes away. Like, why does it go away? Yeah. Like, yeah. Got the information needed. Got rid of the shit, rest of the shit, stuck it back there. It's running on autopilot now. You don't even have to think about it. Okay. So, like, uh, this is kind of going to the thing where I said, like, you know, I heard that, like, hypnosis is like, you know, kind of a more simple concept. Uh, not, you know, not like countering what you're saying, but like, uh, that, you know, um, people get hypnotized on a daily basis. Uh, this, I heard this from like, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody I, I knew who was studying hypnosis and NLP and it was fascinating to me. Uh, and like, you know, he said like, you know, like that, 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 you know, when you watch a movie, you become hypnotized when sometimes when you're talking to a person, you know, in a street or they're, they're like very, uh, uh, what do you call it? Passionate about what they're talking about. And you kind of, uh, I think it's called an alpha wave state or something. Your brain goes into like, just like absorbing information and, and stop like critic, uh, like, uh, the critical mind and like stop trying to counter because you, you, I guess you trust the source in a sense or whatever. And then you just intake information. So like the, the kind of question I have uh, for you about that is like, you know, what is the level or, and is there any damage like, you know, done like from media, like when you watch like a violent movie or something like that. Think about it. Think about it this way. Um, mm -hmm. Unless you actually go into a trance state, unless you're actually actively disengaging your, your conscious mind, your critical thinking, like you're not in trance per se. You're not in mm -hmm. hypnosis. Okay. Okay. Trance there versus is, hypnosis. At least, at, yeah, at least, at least from the way I think. So remember, all models are wrong. Some models are useful, right? Yeah. It's just uh, the way I'm, I look at things. Okay. Yeah. So I don't look at watching a movie as you're being hypnotized. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that said, your unconscious mind is always looking at all the information coming into it and mm -hmm. deciding true or false. Mm -hmm. Does this match what I believe? Does this not match yeah. what I believe? Right? Uh -huh. Does this reinforce what I already know or not? Right. Uh -huh. And if it reinforces, if it aligns with what I already believes, that gets added mm -hmm. to the pile of evidence that this thing is true. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's take um, the pill ideology, put one on a pedestal, right? Mm -hmm. You've already got that as a belief. You already mm -hmm. believe that women are perfect, yada, yada, yada. So mm -hmm. watching all these movies, reading all these books, listening to all these songs about how women are awesome, mm -hmm. that's just further reinforcement of the thing you already believe. I see. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh -huh. Now, there's ways to use things like hypnotic language and different things like that to try and uh -huh. make messages more impactful and try and persuade and so forth and so on. Uh-huh. 
in my opinion, or at least in my experience, mm-hmm. unless you're actually, do you have that actual direct access to your unconscious mind? If you've not uh-huh. if you've actually dropped that wall, yeah, mm-hmm. that's really the only time you can go in and change one belief to another. Mm-hmm. Right. But the thing is that we often, often, the things you're talking about, the kind of persuasion you see and so forth and so on, are just reinforcing things we've already been taught since childhood. Uh huh. So it's like a the confirmation bias had. or something? It's like con- that? Yeah, it's like confirmation bias on crack. <laughs> I know what that's good, right? right? <laughs> it's trying to it's trying to reinforce things that yeah. you already believe, right? Because mm-hmm. that's how your that's how your unconscious mind uh, works. It's like if I already believe it, it's true. Mm-hmm. If it conflicts with what I already believe, it's false and can be safely ignored. Yeah, uh-huh. which is why change is so hard mm-hmm. in a lot of ways because your unconscious mind is like, sure, I know you're telling me you're awesome, but I think you're you're a piece of shit. So uh, I don't I care if you tell me you're awesome. Yeah, because I, I believe I, the opposite. And I'm just going to ignore all that shit. So I heard something about like affirmations, right? <laughs> like, you know, I read this really awesome book uh, called "Feel Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway," which yep. was uh, mentioned in uh, Alan Roger Curry's book Mode One, which yep. I'm finding not so effective, but uh, you know, it uh, it does have some good stuff in it. But like uh, one, one, like you know, so I started say, saying affirmations while I was going through my daily life. And they really were kind of, they were working, but like, you know, obviously not to where I didn't get into uh, trouble again. But one thing that I heard uh, when watching YouTube video uh, that I didn't uh, realize was, I mean, that, that I don't know if it's true or not, but, it, but you know, it, I changed my affirmation language based on this was that, you know, if the uh, affirmation you're telling yourself is not really true, like your mind is like your subconscious mind is not going to believe it. Right. So like, you know, like, like the, the three affirmations, if I can remember them was I like, you know, like I was saying, like, I am strong, I'm courageous and I'm fearless. Right. Well, obviously I'm not fearless and, you know, and, and I'm gain, I've been gaining strength and, and all these kind of things. And so they, they, like, they say kind of like change the language to like, you know, like a, I'm, a, a, I'm a, a work in progress or like, you know, I'm becoming more courageous. I'm becoming uh, fearless, you know. Uh, yeah, there's, mm-hmm. Let me go ahead and get into a few things on that. Okay? Sure. So mm-hmm. affirmations are a way of essentially programming a target for your unconscious mind. Yeah, saying mm-hmm. I want to go here, right? Mm-hmm. This is what I want to be. This is what I, this is who I am, right? Yeah, so trying to give you know, trying to give a you know a direction to your unconscious mind of like, give me this, give me more of this, whatever this happens mm-hmm. to be, right? Mm-hmm. So they need to be stated in in terms of um, <clears throat> present tense, like mm-hmm. I am X, I am Y. Mm-hmm. Um, to actually have any real effect, like oh, okay, say like I'm rich. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm wealthy. I'm successful. I'm living my best life, mm-hmm. right? If that's your affirmation, what you're telling your unconscious mind is you want that money, you want that success, you want to be living a good life. All right. I see. Cool. Now, if there's no conflicts with that, uh-huh, if, you, uh-huh. if your unconscious mind believes that's okay for you to have, it'll help uh-huh. you get it. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. If your unconscious mind is like, I know you want to be wealthy and successful and live a good life, but you're a piece of shit that doesn't deserve that. I see. And what happens is your unconscious mind is like, sure, you can say that uh, as much as you want to in the fucking mirror. I'm never going to give it to you. Yeah. Or I'm uh, going to give it to you and take it away. Okay. Something okay. like that. Because you don't deserve to have it. So I'm not going to let you have it. There's a conflict yeah. between. I'm going to make it even worse for you. Get a taste of it and, and then take it. it. Yeah. 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 It's like, this is what you want. This says you don't get to have it. You're doing this. Guess which side of you went? So your unconscious mm-hmm. mind. Right. Mm-hmm. So you can say affirmations until you're blue in the face. Yeah. It's never going to get you what you need, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, it's actually a great diagnostic tool. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're doing affirmations for 30 days, you're not seeing any effect. Okay, there's mm-hmm. a fucking reason for it. There's a conflict mm-hmm. between what you're saying you want and what your unconscious mind is going to yeah. allow for you. Mm-hmm. There's conflict there in some way. So you're saying, I'm strong, I'm courageous, I'm fearless. And your mind is like saying, no, you're fucking not. You don't mm-hmm. feel anything. Mm-hmm. Say, I'm becoming stronger. I'm becoming more fearless. I'm becoming more courageous. Like, okay, cool. I'll let you become a little bit more. I'm never going to let you get to where you want to be. Ooh, wow. Yeah. I didn't yeah. <laughs> think of that. Anything of that. Yeah, yeah, and it goes back to that models thing. All models are uh, yeah. false. <laughs> like, All models are wrong. Some models are useful, right? And, and yeah, so that's yeah. the trap of the becoming piece, right? Okay. Mm. But even that is one where that can be very useful sometimes. Like, mm. You can say, I am becoming a healthier, more fit man. 
Mm-hmm. Then you're saying you want to help yourself develop those habits to do that, right? Like mm-hmm. if, I'm, if I'm 350 pounds eating Cheetos all day, saying I'm healthy and fit and beautiful, your mind's like, really? Mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. If you say I am becoming healthier and more fit and take care of my body, mm-hmm. that's much more believable in reach. Yeah. You know? And then if that starts working great, as you're seeing progress, you can say I'm healthy and I'm fit and I love my body. Mm-hmm. Maybe that works. Uh-huh. Right. So yeah. it depends upon what stage you're in and where you're mm-hmm. at in your transformation and where you're going. Yeah, give us all kinds of uh, best. Like contextual, you know. Uh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so one thing that I kind of wanted to, you know, like, I guess it's more of like a testimony of what, sure. you know, has uh, happened since, you know, like, so uh, one thing that, well, you know, I, you, how about you talk a little bit about like why you decided mm-hmm. to, to work with me and kind of what you were wanting to work on and, and sort yeah. of where you're at now because of that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so initially, like, you know, I, I contacted you like pretty much a year before mm-hmm. I took any uh, uh, steps uh, to doing it. And uh, initially what I wanted to, you know, when I first uh, came to you was to work on addiction, right? Uh, But then when I came to you, uh, you know, this time, like, I was like, well, you know, like that's, I want to work on these root issues, like abandonment stuff, because I have a feeling that that's really causing the addiction and there's no real addiction issue in of itself. And so I, uh, what do you call it? I, um, uh, I, I was struggling a lot with, uh, you know, self-sabotage in terms of drugs mm-hmm. and uh, uh, was like, you know, again, like getting like getting better and then, and then falling apart. And so, you know, um, you know, I, I, I ended up having this, you know, free hypnosis session and like I was so impressed by it. But like, you know, the, the guy pulled some real bullshit that uh, that just like was like fucking uh, like I was like. This is just can I wouldn't work with this guy if he paid me kind of thing, you know, right. after that yeah. kind of experience. And like the fact of the matter was, is, is because, you know, the session was free. Like, you know, if I'd given the, uh, the choice between you two, I probably would have went with you. But like it was a free session. But like, uh, you know, I was like, I want more of this. And like and and so it was just like the first thought was like, you know, Ryan Christensen, because, like you know, watch, you know, your videos and all this stuff. And so um I was, I had come pretty like, you know, like after that first hypnosis session, I came a lot further than where I was. Okay. So like, right. you know, things really changed. Like uh, one of the, the, the main things that, you know, we spoke about was like, you know, uh, fixing other people's problems. Right. But like, I was so overboard that like, you know, I was becoming like obsessed with other people's problems and like, you know, like, yeah, all this, the, like, I'm very good at, like, analysis and psychoanalysis and psychology, and, like, I'm, I'm very good at, like, assessing issues, like, you know, that's where I really kind of identify with Rolo, because, like, you know, yep. like, I, I'm, like, like hyper-analyzing things all the time, uh, but it was really coming to a fault, because it was so much that it was unappreciated, not only unappreciated, it was pushing my friends away because mm-hmm. like, like, all right, well, you know, yeah, that helped stop you. Stop trying us. to fucking fix me. Yeah. 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 Stop trying to fucking fix me. But also like, like give me some fucking time to like live my life. You know, I'm sending messages right. fucking like, you know, like, you know, I thought about the problem some more. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm like obsessively thinking about another person's problem, like all fucking day. And all my like, red pill studies were going towards other people's women issues and not my own, like my own on a very uh, bare, uh, uh, bare level. And so like, um, I, but, but another thing that was happening was that although my addiction issues uh, started to become much less, like I was still, you know, and I still like use, well, I, I used drugs once since our uh, session, but I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But like, um, you know, like, like it was still too often, you know, like I, I, I realized that I didn't want to stop using drugs completely. And, and I still feel that way. Cause I, I do like them and like, you know, but like, uh, but it was like, again, it was like still out of my control in a sense. It was like, it, it got better, but like, you know, like, like one of the things that I've been doing that, that, that you know, is one of the key things that, you know, helps a person Uh, with women is working out right Right. well if you're like doing meth like once a week 
uh, or like Coke, like, you know, and then, or both like, you know, uh, twice a week or something like that. And you're working out. Well, every time you do meth, you're like, that's four days of like not working out. And then on top of that, you're losing muscle mass and like, you're like, cause you're not eating right and all, all this kind of shit and you're not working out. And then like, it's like, like, okay, well it's back to square one, back to square one. And like, so all the working out you're doing is just basically keeping you in the same fucking uh, uh, place that you were like uh, in like two months ago, three months ago or whatever. And um, I was like, like the, one of the things that was really paining me was that I went out on this date with this girl and like, I really liked her and she was going away in like three days. Uh, so we had a very short time to get to know each other. Uh, but I felt a very strong connection. And it was like after the second date when she was, uh, you know, I didn't think I was going to see her again. I became so fucking devastated like, like I was fucking crying and it was like, it just reminded me of the shit that like I happened between me and my mother when I was a child, like, you know, like uh, just abandonment stuff. And it was so fucking painful. That I was like, man, like if I'm ever going to continue with dating or anything, I was afraid to go out on another date after that yeah. because I was like, I don't want to feel that again. And so I was like, man, like, I have got to do a fucking hypnosis session like as soon as possible, because if I don't like, I'm not fucking going to get any sex. I'm just like, like that's it for me because yeah. like the, the fear, the pain, it was so good. I, I actually compared it to being a pain worse than heroin withdrawal, which I have a lot of experience with. And, and that's really fucking intense. So the, like, you know, the, the intensity of, the, of that situation was, like so much more like that. I would rather have been going through heroin withdrawal. And so I, I, yeah. and so like, I, I, I wanted that's to get something right there. It's like, I'd rather have heroin withdrawal than go through. Yeah. Heroin. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. And so like, uh, so like that was the major reason that I came to, you. but like, you know, I, I still kind of noticed my, my drug use was still out of my control. Uh, but that wasn't the reason I came to you. And actually, you know, before our session, like I had done meth, like I think, you know, four days prior to that. And so I was still recovering from that one when, uh, when I uh, entered the session. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, and going into the session, um, those abandonment issues came up and everything like that. But like, here is where the thing that like, the, one of the major things that, that I know is because I, again, did not come to you to deal with addiction issues. I just said like, I want to use drugs, but I just don't want to be like controlled and owned by them in a sense. Like, yes. you know, uh, but what ended up happening after that. So like I ended up, uh, using, uh, uh, Coke, like, uh, one more time, and like, you know, I'm a needle user when I use drugs and like, you know, and, and I'm okay with that and it's fun and all that, but like, it's like, it's really intense. And the aftermath of needle drug use is a much more heavy than with regular drug use. But what I noticed with that, and this is kind of similar to the first experience was that like, you know, um, when like afterwards, it's almost like needing to test the what's going on you know where am i really you know like you know and so like you know i i i had that uh that that coke experience and it was a lot of fun but also kind of uh, there was a certain worrisome aspect to it but like you know after that i was like kind of like had in mind like and i still do but like i had this plan for this other drug thing that i wanted to do but here's where the thing really fucking took a turn that was unexpected for me uh, it was that, you know, I was working out and working out like, you know, more and like thinking about this drug plan and being like, you know, okay, well, you know, I should do this sometime. And then it's like, but I don't, but not now because I'm like, I'm gaining all this muscle, like, and I don't want to fucking, uh, like, you know, uh, destroy that. Like, I don't want to set myself back. And then like these plans for drugs started to take a back seat. And it's just like, it's like, like well, I'll do that situation, but maybe in two weeks, and maybe. Like, and now it's like, I'm in a place where like, okay, well, maybe am I going to keep putting this off like over and over and over again, or maybe I will do it. And maybe I will, maybe I have already gotten to the point that I really wanted to get, 
where I don't want drugs out of my life, but they're like, they're not like uh, in this overbearing area where it's like, where, you know, give me an example, like, you know, uh, like there's a certain time of the month usually where I have consistently used drugs on that same day, uh, you know, um, every single time. And I've actually sabotaged quite big things over it. And, you know, that day was actually today. And the thing is, like, the thought didn't even come to mind of like, oh, man, like, you know, payday's here. Like, go, yeah, like, like, go, go get a gram of Coke, go get some ketamine, go get your needles. And like, and it's almost like, you know, no matter what the situation was before and whatever I needed to do, it was like I had all the things like, all right, you're not going to do it this time because you, you're going to take responsibility. You got things you got to take care of and all that. And then the day comes and it's like, all right, well, the, the fucking like uh, draw is so strong that it's like, uh, like there's no choice in the matter, really. Right. Yeah. But this time it wasn't even like making a decision. It was just like, like the, 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 the thought that I had was just like, oh my God, you're not thinking this. Oh my God, is this really happening? Are you really going through this day? Like, like, you know, like you're not even like you're buying the drugs and like, you know, going to use them after this interview with Ryan, like, which you probably wouldn't have held on to and use them before anyway. Like, like it, 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 it's like, it's fucking mind blowing to me. Like the, the level of impact that hypnosis has and it, and and it's like uh, I haven't done much dating since, so I haven't been. In, I have a date tomorrow, but I haven't. Uh, but also, I don't. Not every girl I meet is always has been that like super like draw of like you know like there's girls out there that's just like oh well this is just somebody to fuck and like and it's over. But then there's the ones that you meet that are just like that super draw. Now that's the next yeah. test to see if if I end up in that situation again and something like that happens, but. The fact of the matter is, like, if all I got out of that was just, like, the fact that I'm free of, not drug-free, but free of the dominance of drugs over my life uh, is so huge because, like, it was such a block to getting shit done. And, and yeah, and, and, and now it's just, like, I don't know, like, it's also another thing that I noticed was that my tolerance for bullshit has dropped to such a low or maybe should I say the opposite tolerance has been raised to bullshit like I don't tolerate it like for like like hardly at all like I mean I was you know in a situation the other day and I don't want to go over the situation because the person who is uh they might see this but thing but like you know like like something happened where it was just like uh kind of uh I don't know, like, uh, just bullshit, like towards myself and I guess resentment or whatever. And I was just standing there and I had a decision to make where it's like, okay, like I can continue the, the night with this person and I know how it's going to end up. And I knew how it would end before when I saw these right. patterns arise, it ended badly with just like more of that resentment coming up and more of that kind of like, uh, uh criticism and trying to put down and then getting into an argument and then like you know but but i needed the i needed the like a, the human connection so bad that like you know it was worth it but but right. this time what ended up happening was like like the bullshit happened like you know a few things were said and then the final thing was said and i was just and then I, and, and i was invited to uh, go with this person and i was just like i'm going home like right. no, I'm, I'm not doing this. Like I, like I, I know where this is going, and like like yeah. being freed from like the uh, dependency on other people to combat loneliness. Like yeah. I've noticed, like from the two sessions, like the first session that I had with the other guy, that I had a much more comfortable time being alone. Uh, yeah. But now my level of comfort being alone is almost scary like you know like it's like <laughs> let me step in here for a few minutes because i kind of want to sure. talk about some interesting things that are going on because of mm -hmm. the thing that we really addressed and focused on during the session we did earlier this month uh earlier in december 2021 is the self-sabotage thing mm -hmm. all right and having given up before all right because yeah. one thing that i see 
with all, with a, a lot of clients is that if they have this pattern of self-sabotage in their life, they're blowing their fucking life up on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. You have to get that out of the way first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Because that's impacting every of your life and you're, you're going to blow up progress that you're making in different areas. Right. And if you've given up before on life, if you've uh, mm-hmm. wanted to end things or if you've just been in that dark space before, I've definitely fucking been there for a long ass time. Oh, really? So I had to deal with this myself. Oh, yeah. Like, I was basically borderline sort of suicidal for like 35 years. Oh, we need to talk about that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Soon. We'll get back to that because it's very mm. interesting. You know, the past six to 12 months has been a very interesting time in my life in terms of personal change. But kind of stepping back to that, when you've been in that place where you've been in that dark place, there's a certain thing where it's like it's almost, you're almost not even really allowed to try. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you just because the, the, the penalty, you know, if you try and fail, it proves all that shit that you think about yourself is actually true. And then you really fucking give up. Mm. So you just gotta put yourself try, right? It's a self yeah. protective mechanism, right? So you have to get that crap out of the way. Mm. You have to get that self sabotage complex out of the way. You got to get the, got to allow yourself, you know, create space for you to be able to make it safe for you to try mm. before you can really do anything else, right? Yeah. So once you get that complex out of the way, mm. then what you're doing is you're moving through your life, you're trying shit that was hard again. Mm. Hard before, right? And see, yeah. okay. What are the changes? Because if there's still issues with addiction and drugs, mm-hmm. there's something that we still need to address. Yeah. There's still issues with like relationships and women and abandonment. Mm-hmm. It's still something we need to address, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're not allowing yourself to have healthy relationships, there's still probably some nuggets there that were separate mm-hmm. from that overall complex that need to be yeah. addressed, right? Mm-hmm. We're not just simple, like one thing. We're not simple creatures. We're fucking mm-hmm. complicated. A lot of stuff is yeah. all like interwoven and knotted up as big ass Gordian knot, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times it's pulling threads until you get that shit loosened up enough that it unravels, right? Mm-hmm. So the fact that you're still contemplating drug use, that's still part of your life. Mm-hmm. Not terribly surprising. Right? Mm-hmm. The fact that you're still not entirely sure about the dating stuff, not terribly surprising. Mm-hmm. Right? We're not sure at this stage. Mm-hmm. What three weeks after your session? Two weeks after yeah. your session? Yeah, you know, because it's only been two weeks since we did work, and you're already okay. Yeah. Changed, right? Yeah, yeah. You know? mm-hmm. But you haven't put yourself in enough situations to know mm-hmm. what's changing, what happens. What yeah. is just a reflection of that sabotage pattern? Mm-hmm. And what there was something more for? Mm-hmm. And the interesting and the thing that I loved about your story about how today is your day to do your thing, and how today it just wasn't even something you wanted to do. You're like, yeah, I'm just not going to do this today. Yeah, that means that that habit was just part of that self-destructive complex Mm -hmm. yeah 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 right Mm -hmm. which means that you know that's that piece of that addiction puzzle that piece of the drug puzzle is probably fixed if it was just a tool you're using to sabotage yourself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not doing that anymore yeah perfect that piece of that box is checked right going on a date tonight how does that go Mm -hmm. we're gonna find out see whether or not (laughs) we're gonna see whether or not there's still shit there that needs to be addressed or not yeah when people who have been through as much crap as you have and been mm-hmm. through as heavy a life as you have, mm-hmm. you've had, you've taken a lot of fucking hits in your life, dude. Like, yeah. You've taken a lot of fucking hits. Yeah. And so the extent of the damage, you know, for, mm-hmm. for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. probably pretty extensive, right? There's probably yeah. a lot of shit going on in there that needs to be unpacked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now, how much of it you need me to help you unpack and how much mm-hmm. you can unpack on your own once we get yeah. the major shit done? Who knows, right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. once you get some of the major shit out of the way, a lot of stuff you can do yourself. A lot of stuff is more understanding mm-hmm. how the world works and being able to make better choices mm-hmm. and having better systems to move through the world. Understanding the red pill versus the blue pill, right? Mm-hmm. Now you've got a different mental framework that's helping you navigate the world. Yeah. Right. You just weren't mm-hmm. able to implement it because there's shit in the way. Now that's yeah, just that's right. to play this again, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a certain balance you have to strike between, okay, I've done a bunch of work, I've cleared out a bunch of crap. Now I need to mm-hmm. be able to figure out ways to act in the world. And those are conscious mm-hmm. processes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of in this place the place that you're in right now is trying to figure out now that we've got this major complex out of the way, now that you're allowed to try, now that you're able to take action and that you're able to implement some of the things you want, mm-hmm. what's actually possible for you now, what's still off limits. Mm-hmm, right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where are you where are you free to act with no yeah. restrictions where are you able to help yourself and give yourself the things you need where are you still fighting yourself mm-hmm. right and it's that yeah. it's that process of like paying attention and observing and, and being very aware of what's happening and what's changing mm-hmm. in your life that shows you mm-hmm. okay 80 percent of stuff is on limits i can do whatever the fuck i want to but there's a slice over here mm-hmm. there's something not right still yeah around mm-hmm. this right mm-hmm. That's where do some more work. Whether that's yeah. more hypnosis, like for me, mm. plant medicine has been a big part of my journey. Um, oh yeah, me come through. I'd be interested in hearing about that. I was trying to write down these notes here, but my pencil broke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, 
for me, talk about my journey a bit, you know, mm -hmm. talked a bit earlier about having always felt like I was different. Yeah. Right? And how being different means life is definitely harder for me than it is for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has to live this good life. That's not for me. Right. And essentially I had basically given up on life mm -hmm. at a pretty young age, probably teenage years, maybe earlier. That was something that you asked me actually in the beginning. Like, do you yeah. feel like you've given up on life? Not like, you yeah. know, like you're going to kill yourself, but like, it's, and, and I was like, yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason why is because I had a client of mine who was, uh, he was a mm -hmm. nurse, right? He came to me for getting he was a career. what? He was a nurse. Okay. Right. Wanted to kind of get ahead of his career. Right. And so we did a couple mm -hmm. of sessions. He's like, outstanding. I'm off to fucking races out to conquer the world. See you later. And then two days mm -hmm. later, he books another session with me. I'm like, why the fuck are you back? <laughs> he had got like because I was confused. I thought we I thought we fixed the thing, right? I yeah, yeah, we were good to go. And he's now he's back. You know, and a week later, I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. And so he had gone to do this recertification test, online recertification test for his job, right? So uh -huh. he'd simply done it a million times before, like CPR, something stupid like that. Yeah. yeah. And he had a full on, full blown fucking panic attack. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I've had those. Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Taking the stupid thing that he'd done a million fucking times. Yeah. After yeah. we fixed all the stuff that was holding it back. I'm like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah. So got him back in hypnosis, did some exploring. It turns out that when he was going through, through school, through nursing school, uh -huh. he got zeroed out. Right, oh. Daily in school, girlfriend leaves him. Life is falling apart. Sticks a gun in his mouth. Whoa! Right. I did that too. I was in that place. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So started asking those questions, and it turned out like the guy, you know, he was like his unconscious, like sure, like kid got everything he succeed. He's talented, he's smart, he's knowledgeable, he's got the drive, all that sort of shit. Uh -huh. If he tries and fails, he's going to feel like he's a loser. If he's yeah. A loser. It's fucking gun and mouth time again. Ah, uh -huh. another so, like, zero. Cannot now. allow him to try. Mm -hmm. Because that possibility of failure equals death, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I've seen it, and I've seen this ever since, and I've started kind of seeing this happen more and uh -huh. more with guys who've been in some really dark places where yeah. if you've been there, that complex of trying and failing equals you're fucking done yeah. comes into play, so you just never allow yourself to try. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big reasons why I was asking you about that is because of this, but also because of my own life, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I started doing trying to do a bunch of work on myself and I realized I've got all these different things and all these different ways I'm kind of sabotaging myself and holding myself back. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to find a hypnotist or somebody to work with that actually can to work on my level and do the kinds of things that I do, right? My, my mm -hmm. methodology is kind of unique. So one of my clients mentions uh, some folks up in Colorado called the MindFix Group. They do a, bu a bunch of mental coaching stuff, right? Wow. I'm like, all right, cool. Their, their model of behavior is the same model I use in hypnosis. They just use different tools to kind of do the change work. It's like, cool. Yeah. So I started working with them. Started doing a lot of work and started getting some insights and stuff like that. And that's where I figured out my uh, self-sacrifice complex of this is how I'm keeping myself alive, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and this, I had this really powerful um, moment during one of them of like, you know, sacrifice is when you're giving up something valuable. Mm -hmm. Throw out the trash, you don't feel shit, right? Mm -hmm. Throwing out the garbage doesn't make you feel yeah. shit, right? Mm -hmm. But if you sacrifice, if you're giving you something of value, mm -hmm. that hurts like a motherfucker, mm -hmm. right? And I realized that me throwing myself under the bus all the time for other people hurt. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which means I'm not garbage. I have to have value. I have to be sacrificing something of value, for mm -hmm. good, which means okay. that shit, that means I actually have value. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Now like, that, uh... 45 fucking years old. This is a revelation I've come to. I have <laughs> reverse I, engineering that, in a sense. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I would never have thought that mm -hmm. that I was in that kind of place, right? Mm -hmm. So they do these retreats. Mm -hmm. Retreats where they do plant medicine and stuff like that. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like uh, psychedelic assistant psychotherapy in a lot of ways where you're using different substances to open yourself up. Mm -hmm. and you got a bunch of facilitators that are doing different coaching modalities. And, you know, are you allowed, allowed to say what kind of, what kind of, uh, I'd rather not just for privacy reasons and stuff like that. Let's just yeah, say sure. that, that that's kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, so I went to one of these things back in July and had some really powerful experiences. I'm sitting there after the at the end of the second day, kind of just sitting on the on the couch and, and recliner by myself, kind of like saying, "God, man, I just feel fucking amazing." It's like I love this feeling. I love being alive. Mm. And then this thought hit me with like, "Oh fuck!" Yeah, where'd that come from? This is the first. <laughs> this is the first no, no. Like I knew where it came from. This is the first time I felt that way. Yeah. Oh, I have something similar. This is the first fucking time I mm. actually feel like living. This is the first mm. time I actually feel like there's something to live for. Oh my God. July 29th, 2021. First fucking time I can remember thinking that in my life. Uh huh. Holy right. shit. I right. had a similar experience like that. 
like uh, I, 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 you know, I never, you know, there's, oh, well, you hear about self-love and all this kind of stuff. People like, yeah. you know, saying like stand in the mirror and tell yourself you love yourself and all this yeah. kind of stuff. But always had a really hard time doing that. And mm-hmm. like, uh, like this was, this happened after the first hypnosis session and it came out of nowhere. Like, I don't even remember what I was doing. I think it was cleaning or like put, fixing my computer or whatever and thinking and whatever. And then the thought just came and it was just like, man, I love myself. And I, and then I was like, holy fuck, where'd that come from? Like, I right. never it's like, what? said that it's like, and meant it for exactly. sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you have these like revelations like, oh, fuck. And, and, and the fact that you're having that revelation now in itself for me is like you spent a very long time where that was not true for you. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And for me, yeah, that's why I always would say to people, like, better. you know, yeah. I don't love myself. I like myself, you know. Anyway. Right. <laughs> so after that, you know, after the session, I'm like, fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling amazing and I really want to live. And like, I'm now seeing all these amazing possibilities for myself. Yeah. Right after that, they decided to leave DC and move to Austin. Yeah. So I did not like DC, was trying to figure out mm-hmm. where I wanted to go, it was kind of like going mm-hmm. through the process. Like, I spent another six months or a year trying to find the perfect place. I just fucking moved to a place, a place I know I like. Yeah. yeah. So I just, like got back at the beginning of August by the beginning of September I was out of my fucking apartment I had an apartment and and, and also my shit was being shipped out right nice. one month fucking gone another one is moments where it's like it's clear that this is a decision I'm making boom I'm fucking yeah yeah Austin. yeah so I get down to Austin get set up and I realize I'm still fucking not doing anything uh-huh. I'm my thumbs I'm not actually fucking taking action and making shit happen I'm like what the fuck uh-huh. and then I realized oh shit I'd given up Oh, I'm wow. I'm not letting myself try. Yeah, yeah. I'm not letting myself fucking do anything. Yeah. Because what if I'm actually wrong about how wow. much What if I'm actually yeah, wrong yeah. about whether I deserve, right? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, failing equals proving to myself that I was right all along that I don't deserve the shit. Right? So I had went on another retreat to go fucking tackle that shit and deal uh, with all that crap of yeah. having been basically suicidal for 35 something fucking years, right? Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I wanted to be alive, you know, even if I was necessarily suicidal, but like, I can't count the number of times I looked up my clock and thought about how easy it'd be just like point and click. Oh, I broke yeah. mm-hmm. right? And it's, uh, even uh, though I never mm-hmm. went down that road in a serious way, I was never that bad off, you know, because mm-hmm. I had that reason to live. My reason to live yeah, yeah. the mm-hmm. greater good, right? So I had yeah. a reason and a purpose to keep going. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there were a lot of fucking times when I just looked over and said, Oh, that'd be so easy. Yeah, I don't yeah. Feel this anymore, right? Yeah. So did some more work back in October, and that cleared out a bunch of crap. And then we did some more stuff in November. I went on a retreat to uh, to go combo, which is um, it's an Amazonian tree frog poison, and it's kind okay. of like a purification and cleansing thing, kind of like getting rid of shit that's not supposed to be there, right? Because I was talking uh-huh. to the lady that ran uh, the plant medicine portion of the retreats. I'm like, okay, I've mm-hmm. done these things. Like, what else should I look at doing? She's like, you should probably look at doing this. Mm-hmm. So I went and did that, and that was a pretty brutal week of doing yeah. it every day because it's not uh-huh. a fucking fun process. That's a brutal thing to roll, roll through. Like, it's yeah, like, 10, 15 minutes of time, right? Like, it's, it's not fun. Um, but at the same time, like, I'd go through that, and then in the evening, some stuff would come up like mm. memories or like emotions or thoughts and like shit that I needed to deal with the next day yeah. I'd go in and do it again. Mm. I feel better about that stuff. And yeah. Stuff would come up that night that I'd deal with the next morning. That was kind of like mm. my week of like shit would come up, deal with it, shit would come up, deal with it, shit would come up. Mm. Deal with it. So by the time Friday rolled around and finished things up on Friday, I felt like fucking amazing. Friday was such a beautiful day. Like I walked in there like mm. going like, fuck, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't know if I can fall through and all this. I think about all the times I've given up on myself in my life and all the things I hadn't fall through on and shit like that. Yeah. Because the day before had been like a fucking brutal day and like I'd almost passed out. It's just fucking miserable. Mm-hmm. Friday turned out to be just this amazing ride, which was wow. so, so good. It just worked. We finally figured out how to make it work for me because I'm a special fucking self. Like shit doesn't work the same way for me as it does other mm. people. So yeah. it took us several days to figure out how to make it work so uh, mm. I wasn't just like suffering, right? So it mm. could actually be something I could work with instead of just like being miserable the whole time. Mm. And we finally figured out, and it's like, oh, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> it's a great ride. Yeah. Beautiful fucking day. Still, it was, it was still like an intense, miserable, like suffering experience, but it was like manageable. Like you could ride that, you could surf it, you know? You could just be in that and just like endure that, and it was good, right? Uh-huh. And then did San Pedro uh, the following night, which is uh, it's cousin mm. Peyote, right? Yeah, uh, heard of it. That mm. was a, that was a fascinating experience. Got some really interesting insights from that. Yeah, and so yeah, through all that stuff, I've gotten 
to process and get rid of a lot of the crap that was holding me back. Uh huh. You know, and got into, you know, started doing some more work with spirituality and things like that. Yeah. Because of some of the experiences I've, I've had while, while working with the plant medicines and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely, definitely made my life a fuckload better. Mm -hmm. Fuckload better. I can't even, I can't even describe how much better, better my life is now compared to six months ago, compared to two years ago. Yeah. Night I have a night and day difference. No, and, and, and it sounds incredible. I have had, you know, some experience with psychedelics, like, uh, you know, recreationally, but like, uh, uh, about two years ago, uh, I did a five gram mushroom trip, uh, with a friend of mine. And, uh, I went into it with the intention that this is not recreation. Like I'm going to explore here. And I did. And, uh, you know, it was the abandonment issues came up. It was like really intense. I was crying like crazy. I think I was crying like, like fucking gushing tears for like two fucking hours. Uh, and the interesting thing about that was I never used any opiate again after that. Like I used other drugs, but I ne yeah, I never used heroin again after that. I never oxys, you know, no, nothing, you know? Uh, so it solved part of the drug problem. The probably the worst part of the, of the drug mm -hmm. issue uh, because it's very hard to fucking come back from heroin. Like, oh yeah, you I can do, imagine, you, like, yeah, I can. I can imagine. Let me let me say something interesting because there's some interesting pieces about this, right? Because you went in with the intention of getting some insight. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. You went in the intention of exploring, figuring out like what's going on, right? Yeah, and you got some insight, right? Oh yeah, and oh yeah. That was that was such a powerful experience, and the reason why the opiates piece is so interesting to me is like the opiates mm -hmm. are the feel-good stuff that's pushing that feel-good serotonin yeah. the whole time mm -hmm. right yeah you don't need to push that button that same way because you resolve that shit while you're in there right yeah now, yeah now imagine doing that kind of thing instead of just with a buddy in a fucking your apartment doing that thing in a setting with a bunch of other people mm -hmm. doing work with facilitators and stuff and coaches there to help mm -hmm. you process that crap well now right. i'm considering it <laughs> because yeah, like, like you know I, I, I kind of thought like, you know, with the hypnosis thing, like being so blown away by it, I was like, oh, well, you know, like I'm, I'm not really into psychedelics. Like I, I figured out like, you know, that I don't really like psychedelics like to get for, as recreational drugs. Like sure. if this is a recent revelation. Like, you know, the friend of mine had some acid and he's offered me some and I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Like, you know, and, and before I was taking anything. But yeah. like, uh, you know, like, but then thinking like with the impact that hypnosis had, I was like, oh, I'll just stick with this. You know, I go do an ayahuasca ceremony. But yes, now yes. after hearing you uh, speak about yeah. these kind of things, it's uh, something I'm definitely considering because, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Dr. Gabor Mate. I don't know if you were familiar with him, Not but familiar. he's an a, a addiction and trauma expert. He's pretty much like the foremost addiction expert in uh, the world. His book, uh, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, is mind blowing. I was reading it, made me cry so many times, uh, particularly also because, you know, like uh, I saw myself in it because, I mean, it was so relatable, but also because I saw my brother in it who unfortunately died about three years ago of an overdose. And, um, and, and, uh, he talks about ayahuasca and like, you know, psychedelics and ibogaine, uh, iboga and all these kind of things. And I was always like, man, this sounds like this could be the, the answer for me. But then after this, and I was like, all right, well, you know, I, I think I found the answer, but so, now I, I guess I didn't. <laughs> here's, here's, let me, let me say a few things. Okay. Um, and again, all models wrong, mm -hmm. some models useful. This is just my opinion. I'm not a fucking doctor yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, right? Mm -hmm. So with that caveat, to me, the different plant medicines and psychedelics mm -hmm. and hypnosis are kind of dealing, playing in the same space, all right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the plant medicines and stuff are allowing you to connect to your unconscious and depending upon your your religion, spirituality, to other consciousnesses or other, mm -hmm. other pieces of reality and so forth and so on, right? It's open the doors mm -hmm. and it's taking you on a journey, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those journeys are not something you can direct or control. Oh, my right? headphones are running going, out of my Okay, that's fine. Um, you're going on the journey that the medicine has decided you're going on. Right? Mm -hmm. It's going to show you what it chooses to show you, especially like ayahuasca is very much that way where it's like, yeah, we're going to, I'm, you're going to be dealing with this whether you really fucking want to or not, right? So in a lot of ways, the, the psychedelics are opening doors and showing you things and it's giving you metaphors and it's giving you insight that you can't normally get to in your conscious state because it has access to shit that you can't get to in your conscious state. It has access yeah. to that unconscious mind, right? Mm -hmm. So it's grabbing stuff and saying, here, pay attention to this, right? Yeah. Which is beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. 
the difficulty with that is that number one, your unconscious is really only open and that door is really only open while you're on that substance. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. have to do all the processing and interpretation after that. you're fucking back in your conscious state in those ways. Oh, you mean like immediately after? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not, not even immediately after, but like you're sitting there, you know, you're doing some stuff while you work while you're in there, sure. Yeah. But then mm -hmm. you then have to try and figure out what the fuck all that stuff meant and do additional work on it while you're back in your conscious state. You're not mm -hmm. altered anymore. Those doors are closed, right? Yeah. The thing I like about hypnosis is we get to go to similar spaces. I get to get back to your unconscious mind. I get to do it in a very directed way. I get to go ask the questions that like really fucking need to be asked. And I can do all the change work while mm -hmm. you're still in that altered state. So I don't have to fight yeah. my way through those walls again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get to do a lot of stuff while you're in that state. Um, mm -hmm. So to me, hypnosis is a lot like doing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy where you're mm -hmm. opening that door and then you're doing work while you're in that altered state. Right. Yeah. yeah. That said, mm -hmm. one thing that I really love about the plant medicines is, is that it can show you shit that you didn't think that you needed to pay attention to. And it can show you things mm -hmm. that you haven't considered. Right. So yeah. you're bringing the, you're bringing the abandonment issues to me and you're bringing the addiction issues to me. And we're talking about self-sabotage, right? That's what, mm -hmm. those are things that we can see that, that are, mm -hmm. they're obvious to us on a conscious level. Right. Yeah. Cool. And that uses tool hypnosis to get back in there, figure out what's going on, do the work. Great. Plant medicines. One of the things I think is so beautiful about those and so amazing is that it's showing you the shit that you didn't even necessarily know that you needed to pay attention to. Yeah, like, I, I don't think I would have right. known to bring abandonment up to you if I didn't have that mushroom experience. Right, right. So those are those those tools. It's all these things are different tools, and they all mm -hmm. work in different ways, and they have different effects. Right. Mm -hmm. So, like ayahuasca, I'm planning on doing ayahuasca at some point here soon. Mm -hmm. Right. I need to find. Mm -hmm. I want to find the right group in the right setting to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have like something to get into stuff. on that by the right group, right yeah. setting. But um, but like that's something something that mm -hmm. i want to do like yeah right now i've already fucking shown the chessboard in the air and there's so many pieces that still need to fall into place so i'm still in a mm -hmm. very in a place of integrating a bunch of shit that's been happening over the past six months so mm -hmm. adding more shit to integrate isn't necessarily the right thing for me to do right now yeah yeah mm -hmm. but once all this stuff comes into place i'm gonna go get some more insight i'm gonna go get yeah. some more fucking what uh -huh. else do i need to look at right uh -huh. go do some ayahuasca to see what that journey is like see what comes from there yeah right and that's going to give me some new pieces to integrate and play with mm -hmm. Yeah, I've dealt yeah. with a lot of. I've dealt with like ninety, ninety-five percent of the stuff that I can consciously see and perceive, and the things that I've that I've that have that have come up with. Like, oh, this is an issue. This is an issue. This is an issue. This is an issue. Right? And I'm still working with some coaches to like navigate the implications of a lot of things that I've that I've done. A lot of the work I've done in the past six months, but I've kind of coming to the end of the work that I can do on my own without having somebody else or something else opening those doors and see and seeing what else needs to come out. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of at the limit of things that I can see that are wrong that I need to fix. So in that case, like using plant medicines and stuff like that to, to show you shit that you still need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful Expose fucking, the wounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Expose the wounds, you know, should hold out the mirror and say, Hey, you still need to be looking at this shit. Yeah. Perfect. Great. You know? And you know, since I have definitely become more spiritual since being, since kind of mm -hmm. going on these journeys, like, yeah, I do think that there's additional stuff going on that's beyond, you know, the scientific and the physical and stuff that we can really explain. You know, we, we, when we first planned this thing, it was just like, all right, well, you know, like, uh, maybe like we'll do like a one, like a, you know, an hour and a half and then another hour and a half or like split it up. And, and then you were like, all right, well, let's just, you know, like kind of like do this in one sitting. Well, but it turned right. out that this one sitting of three hours is the first half. Like, you know, like, so it, it, I think it's a really good thing. And, and, and what, what we'll do is we'll end here and, uh, I'm probably going to post this part as part one. Uh, very quickly, maybe even have it up tonight. I want to just edit some uh, things awesome. out, like not like you know uh, content, but like uh, you know breaks and awesome. like uh, stuff like that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like, uh, yeah. I think this is like a fucking super awesome part one. Uh, I, this is fucking great, man. Like, I'm and I'm I'm really looking forward to us getting together again and uh, continuing with this conversation because I have We're a really good lead off man. point. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, I'll let you know when it's up, man. It's Sounds good, awesome. man. Take care of yourself. We'll talk to you very soon. All right. All right, Cheers. man. Catch you on the flip side. Bye.